Hello. You're listening to the Eric McKenna Project. Well, I appreciate you being here. For sure. Thank you very much. There's, uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different avenues if I want to go down there. I don't want to burden you with too much randomness here. <laughs> Random's but, good. All right. But I appreciate it, Matt. Um, right off the bat, uh, tell the audience a little bit about your background, if we can. So I'm an associate professor of economics at Duquesne University. Uh, this fall, I'll be starting my 12th year there. I got my PhD at West Virginia University. Um, for undergrad, I went to a school called Claremont McKenna College. Mm -hmm. Good name, I guess. It's a great name. Um, <laughs> great name. In Southern California, and I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. But you went to school in Southern California. I did go to school in Southern California. Claremont is about an hour east of Los Angeles. Yeah, so there's two cultures differences there. Huh? <laughs> it is growing right. up and growing up in spot. good old uh, San and then Fran, I Oakland. Went back to San Francisco after okay. undergrad and coached high school baseball for a few oh years. Oh my gosh! And moved from I, I I always say I must be the only person that ever moved from San Francisco to Morgantown, West Virginia. So that yeah, was, that's that pretty was, random. That was a pretty, whenever I was, whenever I was interviewing for jobs, I would I would I would describe how you know I grew up in San Francisco, but you know now I'm in West Virginia, and the question was always, well, how did you end up there? So yeah, <laughs> how are you getting through? the pandemic here it's fine you know as as uh as much as everybody else i think we're all kind of going through the same thing i've got i've got two little ones running around um daycare has been closed for a while so it's 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 been a lot <laughs> but it's been, been fun closed. i think what i think what a lot of people tell me when they ask that question is well i think you'll you'll look back on this and appreciate all the time you're able to spend <laughs> with your kids and i think and hope that that i do but that's the correct <laughs> answer <laughs> with them not being in daycare this is going to sound like the most ridiculous answer ever but with them not being in daycare what i think we found the hardest was trying to come up with like three meals like oh. unique meals a day because usually we take them to daycare and they feed them breakfast and they feed them lunch and we <laughs> handle dinner and now it's just like day after day after day after day you don't want to keep giving them the same things but th I, I think i think i'm speaking for a lot of people oh yeah I, that's not unique to me i've heard that <laughs> I, so often too it's like uh one one person said to me she goes this is going to sound horrible but i've like really had to become a good mother i go you're you're a great mother she goes no you don't understand like a textbook good mother because there's all this time, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a lot. And I feel bad. He had a birthday last week, and you know we you know, really didn't have can't have this large party. You know, usually we have a lot of people over the house, right. and everyone's having fun, and right. we'll figure out something to do outside with a friend or two, maybe. But talk a little bit about out. what Duquesne uh, or what you think Duquesne is planning on doing here for the fall. So, I, God bless them for having to come up with all this on short notice. Um, what they are doing for the fall is this model they call it high flex model and what that means is for most courses there's uh what what they would like to see in most courses is um in person instruction but classrooms are um reduced size so at most 40% um some of the other large lecture halls are even smaller than than 40% um, that would involve a professor giving a lecture in a classroom. Um, students have masks. Professors have masks. Um, they're kind of staying. Everyone's, um, you know, distanced within the classroom. I yeah. believe they're getting a bunch of um, cutouts of stuff to put in the chairs. They don't want the students to sit in, you know, oh, so they can oh, sit okay. in the proper chairs. Okay, okay. Um, Instead, they just can't X them out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, yes, they could. Um, I think this is just like, you know, one step further to really make certain they're not sitting in the chairs they shouldn't be sitting in. If we start seeing cut out silhouettes of human beings, then we know we're in trouble, right? <laughs> a colleague of like mine baseball's had, a, doing, had right? a suggestion to like, you know, why don't we sell ad space on the, on the cutouts Brilliant and we can idea. fundraise off that. I thought Brilliant that was a pretty idea. good idea. Uh -huh. I think we had a faculty meeting last week and I, I, it was, I don't know if it was said in jest or whether it's actually going to happen. Like smiley faces are going to be on them, which is kind of oh almost gosh. out of kind of creepy, but it's kind of creepy. Yes. <laughs> nevertheless, it is what it is. Um, Forty percent, and so what a lot of professors are going to have to do is, um, when their course enrollment is greater than the capacity of the classroom, they have to split the class up into cohorts. So, yeah. um, if you're the in, you know, if your if your cohort is in person on Mondays, then you're there in the class on Mondays, distanced from everybody, wearing a mask, taking in the lecture, and then those that are not 
allowed to come or not in that cohort can watch virtually. There's camera right. setups and all sorts of stuff that are in the classroom. Um, they can wheel around. Uh, it's it's a whole it's a whole rigmarole. I think they're getting additional microphones to make the sound better. I, I believe that was brought up at the last meeting, but it's um it's a process. And I also, uh, you know, I'm I'm in the business school, and so we're pretty face to face, traditional kind of in a classroom. I don't know how like an anatomy lab mm -hmm. would work. I, I just don't know. I'm sure there's plans for that. I'm sure they're they're figuring all that out or, you know, labs where you need to physically be there to do stuff, maybe their distance as well. I, I again I don't know that angle of it. That's not my area of instruction. Mm -hmm. But some mm -hmm. the, the the plans are remarkable. Um it's it's a lot, uh, you know, at, at all levels of schooling. It's it's impressive what they've come up with. Has Duquesne made any announcements in regards to to athletics? Uh, I believe <clears throat> I believe that, so for football, Duquesne is in the NEC, the Northeast mm -hmm. Conference. Mm -hmm. I believe the Northeast Conference postponed the season. I don't think, I think postponed is the word they used. I don't think they said canceled. So I think the... Spring, I'm guessing? I, I That to me seems to be where this is going. I know I just read an article yesterday that the big five conferences, the power five conferences in college football are kind of now batting around the idea of maybe moving towards the spring. Um, I believe over the weekend, the Mid-American Conference, right. um, they they dropped it. So I, I think the dynamic that's difficult for these universities to handle is how can you, how could you go full force into football when we've got all these mitigating factors in the classroom? That's kind of a... a, a, a oh, the they, optics they, they are bad. Be, the optics, <laughs> but they want to be consistent, and I applaud them for wanting to be consistent yeah. you know, with that. And so I think that's kind of what they're playing right now. The SEC announced last week that you know, if they're having games, here's what they're going to look like. And it was um, coaches wearing the, you know, the gaiters, the things that, you know, cover your nose, mouth, and neck. And that and any players on the sidelines not in the game are covered. And any player that's on the field that comes to the sideline to talk to a coach, they have to cover up. So it's going to be interesting, you know, to say the least, to see how this all shakes out at the end of the day. People like football. People want mm -hmm. football. Um, mm -hmm. But, boy, there's a lot of close contact in football, and so that's something that you know, well, that's trying to manage. That's what really puzzles me is, is there was all this um, deliberation with the restart of baseball, with the way baseball is played, and I know you're a big baseball enthusiast. Sure. There's a good amount of time spent in safe distances from other there is actually, combatants, right? right? I mean, especially if you compare it to the other three major sports. Absolutely, you know, you're right. Actually, it is kind of a socially distanced game to a certain degree. A absolutely. Um, I, and I remember when people were saying coming back, they said, "Well, how's baseball going to work?" And they said, "Well, you know, there's times where a player slides into a base and you're close, and it's like, okay, take that same criticism over to basketball, and football. Then, my God, they're on top of each other. You know, different strategies for each. You know, basketball's doing the NBA is doing the bubble kind of thing. So, right. trying to keep them away from everybody else. But right. baseball chose not to do that. And there's been a couple teams that have you know been hit with this a little bit. Um, yeah, but I think baseball regrets they didn't do that. Now, I bet you if you put Manfred, which I'm not a big fan of the man's decisions, uh, but you put him in a room and you really question him hard again, I bet you that would have been a better way to go. Uh, yeah, I think the. Um, I think the logistics of it would have been unique. A couple um, cities. Right? Yeah, I guess a couple cities, but, you know, when do you have the time to get all the games in? You need to be at multiple fields. I, I know early in the process they were banging around the idea of having it at, like, Arizona and Florida, where the spring training sites are, because you've got a lot of the infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. Boy, have fun playing outdoors in Arizona in August. I think that was a you, consideration. Right, so it's... It's tough. Um, you know, it's it's not easy. They're doing what they can. Um, Night games and, were the only option, really, right? Right. In which case, then you need to have a lot of different facilities, a lot of different mm -hmm. crew. Now we have more people in the equation, you know, mm -hmm. that you have to try and bubble away from everybody else. So it's mm -hmm. tough. It's a logistical... It's difficult, man. Yeah, the, the hockey... I guess the hockey's worked, right? They haven't any positive tests at all. Uh, right? I, yeah, not that I've that I've heard of. If you can um, trust the testing data for right. what it's worth. And the thing with hockey is they're playing those games... Are they doing them commercial free? Is it a, like Olympic style? I did not thing, know that. I, I don't uh, don't quote me on that. They may or may not be doing that. But the thing about the Olympics that is so great when they play hockey is there's no commercials, so you've got a 20 minute period mm -hmm. that maybe takes 25 minutes to finish. Right, you got a right. 15 minute break. Another 25. You could bang those games out. So if you know you open up you know your sports app or whatever it is, and you look at the hockey games for the day, it's like. 12, 2, 4, like they're just, they're banging them out and I don't, you can't really do that with baseball not if you're going to go full nine innings, you know, I know mm -hmm. there's it's amazing in baseball this season that 
people are so resistant to rule changes and it always have been in baseball right mm-hmm. i mean you remember the the traditionalist versus of the, course i mean you remember in the 90s when they started doing interleague play i mean people mm-hmm. were uh, beside themselves mm-hmm. right and then this year we've got you know we've got schedules and then teams are you know being you know they, they test positive so now the, the the marlins don't play for a week they're like, ah, well, you're over here, so why don't you go play this team tomorrow? I mean, they're just they're making Anything up the goes. schedule day after day. A designated hitter, and then there's right in the National League, which is unfortunate. But we can oh, get into that later. we could have that discussion. I'm on the other side of that fence, <laughs> okay, my friend. Well, we can get into that. That's fine. But then you know they're starting to realize they need to get the 60 game schedule in. They only banked like you know six or seven days off. No one cares about the Marlins anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they're in first place, um, and. Now they're like, well, we realize we're going to need to get some double headers in here. Right. Eh, just have right. them be seven innings each. And said, no, I mean, these. Exactly. <laughs> they're starting a runner at second base, right? right. In things, extra innings. Or right. Else. Things that in years past, people would there's no way we're doing seven inning double headers. The union would have fought. I mean, like, there's no way we're doing right. this. And now everyone's just, okay. Which, which may, you know, that may usher in rule changes for sure. going forward. sure. Experimentation's a good thing. Because yeah. that, you know, with the runner at second base, there was uh, there were a couple of minor leagues. You like that? that? We, um... You know, uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, like you, I don't need to watch an 18 inning game. Mm-hmm. Um, on the flip Not side, starting at 10 o'clock p.m. <laughs> on the East Coast, I don't. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I, maybe it's the kind of thing. And this even this sounds silly. Well, I guess it's kind of like hockey. You know, maybe in the regular season, I'm okay with us doing that to get us to a, a game like a shootout is in hockey. Maybe when it comes to the playoffs, we we, we play the games all the way through. Um, but it is what I think is neat about all the experimentation here, and especially with the runner at second base, is how teams just the strategy of the decisions that are made kind of along the way. Because you know, with the whole Moneyball thing, right. people are you're an A's fan, so there you go. Get right. the whole Moneyball thing. You know, bunting's kind of gone by the wayside. Uh-huh. We don't bunt that. We don't want much. Yeah. Now we get in the extra innings. If you hold the other team, now do you bunt here? Yeah, I, I thought that if, more interesting decisions. I do, and I like the decision making because a lot of times when it comes to baseball and coaching, you just kind of there's not a lot of room for improvisation. You just kind of go by what the numbers say, and off mm-hmm. you go. Mm-hmm. Um, Another reason why I'm sure you don't like the DH. Then <laughs> we might as well talk about that now. It's just I mean, <laughs> managers are just even more castrated in this situation <laughs> now because. You know, <laughs> but we, but we always just can't hit. It's proven. You're a statistical guy, it, right? <laughs> Some there's a few. I mean, imagine a if few. You, imagine if you can get a pitcher that hits, though. Think of what so an advantage that, that's going to be. A variable, yes. Okay. It's just you know every fourth day. I think. Fifth day. I think you know having pitchers hit just it goes so deep into even like roster construction because you mm-hmm. know you're going to be doing double switches. You know you're going to be doing all that. There's just a whole, I think, strategic angle of the They're game that you're losing. Killers. Pitchers are? <laughs> yeah, don't you think? From an offensive standpoint. But imagine when they're getting hits, and I mean, those are the highlights as the pitcher comes up and gets I a guess, hit. <laughs> I guess. I guess. I don't know. I, I remember I, I remember being at PNC Park um, for whenever Garrett Cole came up and uh, made his first start, and I think it was against the Giants. I remember it was during the week. It was I think it was a Tuesday. And he sat there, and pitchers don't bat in the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. Now, he hadn't been in the minors that long because he went to college, but pitchers and uh, sometimes pitchers, if they're good hitters, will DH, but they don't generally hit when they're pitching. Right. Garrett Cole's not one of those, so right. he I, by best guess, I think the last time he hit was in high school. Live. It's amazing. In an actual game. Gets That's up amazing. and gets a hit his first at bat. <laughs> and you want to get rid of amazing. that for the DH? I mean, here's the thing. Let me ask you this, Eric. Let, let's do this then. Okay. If if we're going to have the DH, then why not just have nine separate guys batting and nine separate guys playing the field? Why have any connection then between... And if you're okay with that, why not just have the same guy bat well, I don't think, 27 outs? Yeah, but I just don't... <laughs> I don't consider... Um, how do I say this? I don't know if I consider a pitcher a complete player. Like a, <laughs> like, a, like, a kick, like a kicker on a football team is specialized, right? I don't... There's a special skill there. It's kind of cool that they have to field their position and they try. Say, they what? try. <laughs> then the, 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 the same <laughs> argument you're making then, <clears throat> excuse me, same argument you're making then is why not march out the kicker on a kickoff, have him kick, but there's 11 guys behind him, and then after he kicks, he runs off the field, and there's 11 guys going to town. Yeah, you got a good argument. You got, <laughs> I, I, I can't defend my position there. I Look, can't. I don't I like can't. watching pitchers bad any more than you do. 
but it's torture. I think you're lo- <laughs> well. It's usually pretty quick, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's. I, I think you lose the strategic angle with regards to the managers, and I think that's that's what that's what I enjoyed was watching them try to manage a game. You've got a pitcher who's doing pretty well, but it's low scoring. You take him out to try and get a run when you can. I don't know. I just I like that. Well, I like that. Well, a lot. bunting. I. Th- I thought may- bunting primarily right around the mid '80s, early '90s became a pitcher, strictly almost strictly a pitcher's function. Now you don't even see effective bunting from pitchers no. anymore. So no, not much. Certainly, yeah. Um, but again, I mean that just gives you the advantage if you could get you know a pitcher that is able to give you that on the offensive end. I mean that's you know a bunt. Or something, yeah. or even hit behind a runner, or something like well, the that. Pirates, the bottom half of their lineup hasn't been able to hit. Period. <laughs> doesn't matter if they were pitchers or shortstop or to I, third base. Doesn't make any. Difference. I watched <laughs> one of the games over the weekend, and it must have. I was oh. in, and and I looked up, and they had you know the, they had the the roster. Uh, excuse me, the the lineup, and then they always have their averages right next to it. And I know it's our painful. Um, our cleanup hitter was batting 0.83. Yeah, it's just <clears throat> not good. <laughs> We don't date these shows. We are early August here. We we are in the pandemic era. We're dating our shows. We try to be as evergreen as possible, but it's hard. It's it's it's, it's hard to not when baseball comes up. It's hard not to at least bring up the Pirates and holy heck, man! So so you grew up uh, West Coast guy. I did. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Ace fan is it right? Ace fan. Yeah, I got my Kansas City A's hat Isn't right here. Great? For I you. saw that Kansas, and I got I have a blue and white, a blue with. Blue with where was that Philadelphia? Was Philadelphia the Athletics? The yeah, that would have been the Philadelphia logo is right. kind of similar, right? So this is the Kansas City one. So they went from Philadelphia the to Kansas, Kansas City, City to Oakland. And I was trying to find. I have another A's hat, and I was digging through all my stuff yesterday, and I couldn't find it. It's um, it's from the seventies. Um, cream here, but I think the same Kelly green here, yeah. and with a green A, and I think it was the manager's hats. From the seventies, I, yeah, I can see it in my cool. mind, and I was looking for it, like in the attic, just sweating. There's oh, like seven, I think, from from sixty nine to now. There's seven different shades of green they've used. Really, no consistency. <laughs> <laughs> and the Kelly green ones now that they're wearing for the home games are just I amazing. like. I I always love the color scheme. I'm I, Charlie Finley had a new oh, thing like Charlie, every year. Charlie right? Finley, that's where the white shoes came from, right? <laughs> that's right the white shoes. And the cut. People forget they had the colored baseballs too at night. Uh. Didn't have the yellow ones, like the yellow colored baseballs. <laughs> <laughs> he would try anything. He had what was it? Herb Washington was the um like the designated pinch runner. Like he had a guy on his roster just to pinch run. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, well, try experimentation, right? That, well, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> okay, so I promised you we would not get into politics. That's not what we do here, but we're probably going to touch around the perimeter of it. Economics in general, does it drive you nuts right now that if you do just peek in at social media or you listen to it um, and if you decide to listen to the news or watch, a, as we talked about, a soundbite somewhere, everybody's an econo- economist. Everybody's an economy or economy <laughs> specialist, right? Sure. Like I'm sure with medicine and others. First off, does that drive you nuts? And number two, how are, besides the obvious, how is that hurting us as a society? Drove, I, I think I've gotten numb to it or maybe used to it. I know when I started in academia, maybe in grad school or right out of grad school, it used to drive me a lot more nuts. I wrote an op-ed at one point years ago about, so my brother is a, a, a PhD zoologist and he's a biology professor in Southern California. And I remember I wrote an op-ed at one point saying, you know, um, my brother does, you know, fantastic research. I don't know a whole lot about it. All I know is, you know, he tends to deal with mice. He tends to deal with um, <laughs> this creature called the vole, which evidently... What is lo- a vole? I don't know. looks like a mouse, but he tells me it's not is of it the same. V-O-L? V-O-L-E. Yeah. A the, vole. The pine vole is what pine he looked vole. at when he was okay. in grad school <laughs> um, and doing postdoc stuff. Um, I think it looks like a mouse, It's a, but it's evidently, you know, like a whole different, you know, okay. evolutionary area. Anyway, so what he does, as far as I know, what he does is you know, mice and these creatures in a laboratory. And what he does, it helps us get down the path of like autism research, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't tell you at all what he's doing. If I started to sit there and try to tell you what he's doing, I would sound ridiculous. And so I kind of took that angle with regards to people talking about economics. And, you know, one thing, one reason I like doing long form interviews is I think getting the right answer in economics takes a little bit of time. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think something that can sound right and sound popular can be done really, really quick. So, you know, we have social media, we have short attention spans, all that. It's so quick just to throw out something that doesn't have a good basis in sort of, you know, economic reasoning, but it sure sounds good. So that's what gets out there and people forward it and they retweet it and, you know, share it and all of that. And it can be, you know, 
we're we're educators first you know it's you know try to get the economic you know truths out there and try and get economic reasoning and get people to to reason better it's an uphill challenge for certain but i think i've gotten numb to it <laughs> you you've been teaching for 12 years is that correct uh so this will be my 12th year at duquesne and then i taught uh i was four years at west virginia university i taught like three of those so okay so my 15 years of teaching so when you were teaching uh when you started teaching social media was in its infancy there was a myspace facebook probably was just kind of starting is that yeah right? yeah um yeah, I think 2005 is when I started at West Virginia. Yeah, Facebook, I think, was just kind of starting to get going at that point. Okay, so you've seen, you've seen the, the pre-social media environment in academia, and you've seen now the post, and the way you folks now have to teach. You have to teach in a different manner now, right? Is there an assumption made that we're in a social media dominant society, so... Maybe attention spans as a whole are shorter. The studying habits are shorter. How we ingest information is different. Yeah, I mean, I, if if anything, you know, if the attention span is getting shorter, then that's just given it to us more of a responsibility to be able to make those proper sound arguments in a quicker manner. You know, uh, before, you know, if I've got you for fifty minutes in a classroom and that's the only economics you're getting because we don't have Facebook, we don't have Twitter, then I'm your primary source of where you need to go. But if I get you for fifty minutes in the classroom, and then you leave and you're walking to your next class and you're getting hit the other way on Facebook, you know, I, I think a focus on, I, I find myself saying this in class a little bit, if you come across this argument, here's a good quick way to come back against that from an economic perspective. If this, then that, you know, your okay. friends aren't going to want to hear a 50 minute <laughs> rebuttal of their points. Right. right. You know, right. there's a, here's, here's a quick way to come back. If someone argues this, or here's like, if they're if they're using this logical path to get here, extend it one step further to show the ridiculousness of it, right? Things like that. How can we do this quickly? Because things are getting quicker. That's kind of the way I've always kind of thought about it in the classroom. Has it evolved? Have you watched the change? Because I don't think Facebook had such a grip on society in 2010, 11, 12 like it has now. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's an echo chamber, right? And, and the, the issue too now is no matter what you're talking about, whether it's pandemic related, whether it's economics, whether it's the sports teams you like, whatever, it always comes back to politics, right? It always like, oh, I'm going to infer what your political bend is based on whatever you've said about something that's not political. It's like a litmus test. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it, it really hampers the ability to have honest discussion because that's what we need, right? Academia is kind of having, you know, a moment with, with can we, can we have true, honest open discussion, right? I mean, we've got a lot of academic freedom issues. We're disinviting speakers from campus that might offend certain people. We need to be able to have those discussions. You need to be able to interact with people you disagree with mm -hmm. in a in a reasonable way to be able to come to a greater understanding, see the other side, see our side, see your side, and have that honest discussion, right? And be challenged in your ideas. And it's 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 disheartening to see a lot of that go away. It's disheartening to see that there's you know, a a speaker coming to your college that might not be of the broad political bent that's popular at the time get disinvited because students are are going to feel challenged or going to feel threatened by this, right? And that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's that's a that's a whole other rabbit hole, yes. but, but so it's so valid though. I mean, um, there's the one that really perplexed me uh, was Jordan Peterson, okay. uh, the author Jordan Peterson, and I I I respect him a lot. I don't I don't agree with anyone all the time sure. but he seemed to be a rational um n definitely not a caustic individual and certainly an educated man and when i knew enough of his work and then would see instances where he was not or he was booed off of a stage or he I, when he engages the his audience but still booed off a stage or, or shamed off a stage like someone that might have a very uh very deep slant either way he doesn't more pragmatic, but still, if it's reaching people like him, if that kind of reaction's reaching someone like Jordan Peterson, then we really are headed in a weird direction. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you have, you have obviously many choices, but it's almost like if Jordan Peterson's coming to your campus and maybe you're not of the same kind of bent of where he's from or what have you, it's almost like, you know, you kind of have a choice here. You can, you can go and listen to the talk and engage with it. Maybe you're able to ask a question. Maybe there's just too many people asking questions, but go and engage with it and think about it. Or you can get together with your friends and try and get them not to come, and that's that's unfortunate. That's sad. That's that's not good. Yeah, and that's it, from and that's from every every direction and every every bent, so to speak. Right. It, but it's 
it's we're making um, and again we're not going down that rabbit hole because there's so much more to ask you. But it's, <laughs> it seems like we really and I, I'm not blaming social media, Matt. Maybe I maybe if you got another answer, but it seems to me it comes a lot of it out of social media where we try to silence the voices that we personally don't agree with. Yeah. Um there's you know there's there's a lot of good that comes from social media. I think one of the kind of side effects here is um I don't even know the right way to say this and it's it's I don't want to say it in a way that sounds demeaning, but you know everyone feels their most they are the most important voice in the room, right? Because you've got the same platform. You know, you can go on Twitter and I've got you know literally the same you know, kind of ability to speak to the world as the president does, as LeBron James does, as, Mm -hmm. you know, I've got the same, I've got a Twitter handle too, and I can go out there and, you know, kind of, you know, maybe it might make people yell a little bit louder. It might make people do a little more of listen to me as opposed to, well, and I see what everyone else is saying. Not, again, not diminishing anyone's voice, but... You're saying there used to be a hierarchy of of, of, of communication accessibility. I'm... I'm not even, and I'm not even saying that's the way it should be. Right. It's just I that agreed. that you have, you know, if you don't have this massive platform in your mind to go and preach to the world, almost by necessity, you need to sit back and spend a little bit more time listening. And that that I guess is the best way I could describe it. I don't think I described that very well, but I no, think I that's the best it. way I, I could describe it. Well, social media kind of flattened the playing field, wouldn't you say, to a degree? Well, right, and that's not again. This is not like a one hundred percent bad thing. I mean, right. there are good things that come with this, and and maybe some things that are are not as good that come with it as well. Yeah, I, I think I've said at prior shows where I heard a guy say one time at a lecture, he said the best thing about social media is it has flattened the playing field of communication. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the not the worst not thing, thing about social media is it's <laughs> flattened. <the laughs> communi- it's given a voice to those who Fair made enough. that moment. <laughs> yeah. Not that they don't deserve it, but they probably were best as misinformed people on this subject. Better advised to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> well, now too, um, you know. We have, I, I see it most with athletes, but I'm sure it happens all over the place. Um, we get some athlete um, who becomes very well known for whatever reason or college football player. And, you know, five years ago in high school, you know, they're saying, you know, foolish things because they're a teenager and mm-hmm. teenagers are known to do foolish things, right? Yeah. And then that gets brought up and cancel culture. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's going with comedians. I've discussed that with other comedians sure. on the show. And, and, and we've had a lot of double standards. We're, I had a comedian on, we're talking about how, uh, one young man was bounced off of Saturday Night Live a week after getting the job because of something he said four or five years ago in college. Yeah. Yet the same week they were bringing Eddie Murphy back, who's right. got a history of saying the most misogynist things imaginable. I know. I and know. Gender I offensive know. things imaginable. I was when I was in, um, I was a freshman in college. I think I was a freshman in college. Is when Chris Rock did that stand up. Was it live in DC? I think yeah. it was. I, don't, I just don't think he could do like ninety percent of that material today. I just, yeah. just no way. And they way. say it, and a lot, a lot of the the a lot of uh, comedians from that era and beyond, uh, you know, a, a George Carlin wouldn't play today. <laughs> <laughs> no, not well. Bill anyway. Cosby might, you know, <laughs> uh, not la- later problems aside. Sure, right. But uh, uh, you know, Richard Pryor wouldn't play. <laughs> Lenny Bruce going way back. Those Jerry Seinfeld seems to be doing okay down that path. Yeah, Jerry did all right. <laughs> but but, but, he, but you know, he hasn't. That's funny you said that because even the Seinfeld show, I think there are certain topics yes. they wouldn't do today for certain. For certain, I w- I always like to think too of um of movies that could never be made today right like um blazing saddles <laughs> <laughs> for, for slightly different reasons i always think the movie big there's no way they can make that oh movie good today. point just in the good <laughs> point. I always laugh at the end of that movie um when the kid walks home and the mom's just hey you're home like <laughs> your kid's been home for like two weeks so just, <laughs> that's what it is i just always laugh about movies well, yeah we're, uh, we're uber sensitive but on the economics <laughs> uh standpoint from your your world when you see it could be MSNBC, Fox News. It could be something you read, The Hill. Whatever you glance at, or you might catch a snippet, and you see or hear something that's so fundamentally wrong from what you know to be true. Number one, does that ever get acceptable to you in terms of just you know part of your day, or does it still infuriate you? Infuriate's probably a little bit of a strong word, but I think what... So I do um <clears throat> I do sports economics and I do at least research wise I do sports econ I do some lawn economic stuff and I do wagering markets mm-hmm. and 
my my grad school training was in political economy and I still do some work there as well. And I think what helps me get through the day a little better on topics like that is there's an economic understanding of the issue, but then also a political understanding of the issue. And there are, are a lot of things that politically look very popular and very good that economically might not be very good. So while not, you know, looking at that issue and saying, oh, you know, getting getting riled up and saying, oh, the economics of this is all wrong. How could this happen? To kind of take a step back and say, well, politically, this seems to make sense for someone to want to move down that path. Economically, it's not a good thing, but at least politically, I understand why they're doing that. Not saying it's a good thing to happen, you know, like... um, you understand the motivation. Yeah, for certain. Like now you've... So, um, again, uh, (laughs) I'm not a big fan of politics, (laughs) but, you know, you're seeing, you know, just over the weekend... You know, even Biden's having ads now that say we're buying nothing but American stuff, nothing but American, buy American, American jobs. When, you know, if it's Trump saying that, then all the Democrat sides say, oh, how could he say that? You know, but it's, it's caustic. It's, it's just it's, it's just caustic. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I guess it's frustrating. But you understand why someone on the campaign trail is saying something like that. You know, it just thinks, though, that academia is constantly um, you folks, regardless of the field, seem to always be the source of information which is what you're there for but it seems to be always uh plucked and picked and chosen based upon a narrative yes and then the facts tend to get distorted to support a certain narrative and that where that's where the public gets confused yes for certain i mean you've got you know that's (laughs) you would like to go from facts and reasoning to narrative but no it goes the other way around right it's the narrative what can i cherry pick Right. That's then going to backwards support what I want to get at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of academics out there, right? I mean, it, you've got not just economists. I mean, there's academics all over the place. Mm-hmm. If I have a certain narrative, you keep digging, you keep digging, you keep digging. You're going to find something by someone with a PhD behind their name to support whatever narrative it is that you want to push. Whether it's an economist, whether it's a anthropologist, whether it's a political scientist, whatever. You'll find someone saying something that you like, and then it looks credible. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that we are so, um, not even left and right, just just side A versus Z, you know, and we can't find or we can't work from B to Y? Big, big broad area there, 24 characters, sure. right? But we go right to the first and the last. I feel like it's, um, I feel like it's a commitment issue. Like, I feel, you know, I feel like if one side on one issue bends, then the other side could just come back and say, we made them break. And now on to the next issue, let's make them break again. So I think it's kind of a, a, a commitment to working with the other side in an honest manner. And we've got these two sides that just, you know, just don't want to work with each other at all, right? Because are, are you perceived as weak if you want to work with the other side? Are you betraying your party? Are you going to not get elected because you're working mm-hmm. with the other side? It's, it's, it's us versus them, right? And it's not a Democrat problem or Republican problem, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's on both sides. It's a... It's, it's it's identity politics. Now, I, I, I'm of the belief, Matt, that identity politics has always been around. I don't think it was very prevalent in prior decades, and that in communication or, or access to technology might have, you know, uh, I don't know, prohibited the expansion of it. Now, today, because we can touch a million people in like a half a second, right. but it's the simplest way I've heard it put to me is it's kind of like the Yankees and Red Sox argument. You are so you know the extremes are the extremes of everything seem to be at the forefront now and we don't live in a world of extremes in reality right but we sure create one when we bleed red or bleed blue right right Right. i mean there's a lot i think society-wise that a lot of people agree on right absolutely but the headlines and everyone gets worked up over that small not the small stuff but the, the the minority of things that we don't agree on and that's where all the focus is but in what you do, new numbers and mathematics and science, you know, there's the, the 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 answer is in the facts, is in the facts as the numbers and science predict them and show them, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly for, you know, for hard sciences, that's certainly the case. Excuse me. And, you know, for 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 economic science, there's certainly a place to be had for empirics and for data and looking for answers. Um, theory is important too. Um, reasoning, you know, all, all of right. that kind of. It, it's easy to try and get economics down the path of just pure nothing but data all the time, and the answer is like pure and perfect and easy. You know, a lot of nuanced problems be looked at a lot of ways. But yes, I mean, for a lot of issues, they can be looked at numerically, and you can get yourself down that path 
And Society would run easier, though, if we did that. It would. We, we also, I mean, where we end up, you don't want to get too much down the path, though, of economics is just something to calculate and get done, right? Because then that kind of starts getting you down the socialism path, if you want to think of that, right? Okay. Like, a, an economy is not something to be solved. But on the margin, there are some issues to look at, like, you know, impacts of tax cuts. What, what was the impact at the end of the day, right? Um, I always like to think of you know, data analysis and econometrics and, and, mm -hmm. and statistics and all of that, I think it's kind of best suited to look backwards at what's going on as opposed to saying, I got a bunch of data here, let me calculate the solution for the future. I okay. think it looks, I think it's better looking backwards. Hard to forecast. Yes, I think it's very difficult to forecast. I mean, that's not going to stop economists from trying, but no, absolutely. <laughs> it's, um, it's very difficult to, to plan moving forward. So the, uh, we talked a little bit off air here um, without going too deep down the rabbit hole, but definitely touching on the subject the word socialism or socialist is now m more in the American vernacular than it ever has been. As a matter of fact, I can remember growing up in the 70s and 80s where... Uh, it was a bad Democrat word. <laughs> yeah, Democrats and Republicans were both Americans and they were both, they were both capitalists and we were free market folks. We just had different ideas beyond it. Um, now, socialism is being... Or the word is being bounced around so much now that there's a greater divide between, I think, the left and the right the problem I have is I don't think most people that are hearing and using the words or using the word socialism even understand what it means. I don't think a lot of the young folks even know what capitalism or pure capitalism, the theory of it anyways, really is. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of a definitional issue now. I think a lot of people use both actually capitalism and socialism to kind of have it mean what they want it to mean. Um, you know, when I hear a lot of people talk about socialism or talk about democratic socialism or we need to try socialism, not going to speak for them it seems to be that they want some sort of system that um cares for people more or maybe we care for inequality or maybe we care for the lower end of the income distribution mm -hmm. caring and 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 taking care of those so i don't you know the economist in me i hear socialism i go the abolition of private property and all the things that come along with that right. and you hear people saying that so right. you kind of right. try to figure what what people mean by that but that's also a problem too that you know people are batting around words that mean different things for different people i kind of um i feel a lot of the same way about the word sustainability that gets thrown around a lot too you know i think and i bring this up in class um when i talk to my students i say what's what's your definition of sustainability and invariably you get, you know, I got 28 kids in class. I got 28 mm -hmm. different definitions mm -hmm. of sustainability. And it's like, well, you know, sustainability is kind of this, you know, this broad concept. People kind of talk around it. And I'm not saying any of your definitions are wrong. Right. But none of them, you know, it's <laughs> there's a there's a article. Uh, it's actually an article from a speech by uh, this economist named Robert Solo. And I, I make it the, the the gist of the, the quote is right. But he said it was he was given to talk about sustainability years ago. I think this was in like 1991. And he said, it's hard to come up with a definition for sustainability. Kind of <laughs> the more you think about it, the better it sounds. Like just, <laughs> it didn't mean that in a good way either. And it's, it's just this, you know, people use that word to mean whatever they kind of want it to mean down that path of sustainability. Um, right. And I think it's socialism. It's a broad term. It is, it's a very broad term, purposefully so, right? It's purposefully kind of vague too, because right. it's kind of to be used as you want it to be used. Right. And right. I feel like socialism is kind of going down that path, even though there's a much more precise definition of socialism. I think people just kind of use it for, you know, we need socialism, we need a higher minimum wage. That's uh, that's A and B. That's not, yeah. <laughs> one doesn't imply yeah, the yeah. other there. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's been... Uh, Again, I go back to the extremes. The extreme right in the country seems to be getting a, a, a stronger stronger hold on the party. The extreme left seems to be getting a stronger hold on that party. But the bulk of us are still sitting somewhere in that middle, and there's a lot of us there. But it seems like we're not being listened to yeah. <laughs> or heard. It's uh, Yeah, I mean, moderation seems to be, you know, not not the coin of the realm these days. Anymore. No, it's not. And again, you know, or was it ever though? We could look. I mean, yeah. I mean, in and again, I'm I'm not big on like presidential history, but I mean, you know, great moderation. He was a great moderate. Great moderate worked with all people. I mean, I I think there have been some people in the past that have been lauded for kind of being in the middle. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that's my opinion. Yeah, yeah. There's it's 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 funny too because a presidents, you can go back and look at the record. Uh, from my standpoint they all tend to govern somewhere in the middle. It still may be on their side of the political um, bent, but they, they move to the middle. Every president does it. Sure. 
even the the variable that we have this crazy variable that we have now with with Trump no cuz no there's no political past to really look at beyond being president but he is still waiting in there too sure so you know it, i mean you're you're within your own party right yes. and you're trying to get your votes for a you know uh-huh. a, a primary and trying to get your votes there and then we've got our other party and you're over here you know within your own party trying to get trying to get trying to get and then all of a sudden it gets general and everyone just you know zooms right to the middle to try and which is probably know. great a great system I, that's i mean it's the the hot dog cart model right you right <laughs> stick exactly. it on the boardwalk where are you gonna that's go it. that's exactly right and so yeah i mean they they end up moving towards the middle uh, absolutely on the other side of the equation when people bounce the word i'm guilty bounce the word capitalist around um and pure capitalism and you know no, pure capitalism cannot work. That's unregulated completely, and that, that's the survival of the fittest. Am I right? Is that generally what a pure capitalism is? Yeah, you know, uh, bare bones, you know, government there just to, you know, enforce property rights, you know, basically. You know, very, very, very minimal. And That would never know, fly large, in this country. <laughs> it never has. Um, you know, very, you know, you're right, unregulated, absolutely. Um, and, and it's frustrating. Maybe you're at, you've asked me a couple times if it gets frustrating. I would say maybe I would get most frustrated when people would say, um, oh, my God, I can't believe we bailed out all those banks in 2008. Oh, that's what you get with capitalism. That's not what yeah, you get with capitalism. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. You know, right. so, again, it's those words, you know, people, they, a lot of people like to use capitalism in, in a derogatory way. They like to say, here's an outcome that I don't like, whether it's income inequality, whether it's right. corporate bailouts, whether it's current capitalism, whatever. And they'll say, oh, that's what you get with capitalism. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that um, there's so much human emotion in our political system yes. too. And, and I, I heard a, I'm trying to think who the economist was who gave the talk, but it was very brutal talk, and and it was brutal in terms of just black and white, and not in terms of today's society black and white, but just facts, right. just factually. Right. And he and he basically said that human laziness, us wanting to get as much as we can for doing as little effort as possible, which we all have that. But that even that human emotion is, is part of the equation. That gets exploited um, and gets manipulated and massaged, and that's part of the equation. He said, but in pure capitalism, that doesn't work. You know, if if, if you really believe, if you believe in capitalism, you say you're a capitalist, you believe in capitalism, the entitlement culture just doesn't work. It mathematically doesn't work. He goes, you can go down a deep water and get in deep trouble having that conversation publicly. But that, that's what the essence of this talk was, and it really opened my eyes. Huh, I, I don't remember hearing that. I always think I'll when find it, that. I'll yeah, find and get that to you. No, please do. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says policy wise. I always feel like this economist Larry Summers at Harvard does a really good job of just speaking like I'm very directly, very directly, very like straightforward. I always feel like I don't have a hard time trying to piece together what he's saying. I always I like watching him talk again. I don't agree with everything he says. Right, right. He right. does a really good job yeah, of doing that. Ro- uh, Rogan, I listen to a lot of Joe Rogan's podcasts and and uh, not all of them, a lot of them. <laughs> but he had uh he had a um oh gosh. I guess he's an economist. So that's his background, but he's a hedge fund manager. Okay, Peter um, Schiff. Uh, yeah, I think that was yes. He just on and it was a, recently. Yes, right. Okay. I found that be, to be very entertaining because they were talking over each other. But beyond that, <laughs> didn't that go like four hours or something? It, yeah, they did. They did it via Zoom, and I guess okay. <laughs> Rogan doesn't like doing Zoom because or Skype, and I guess because they end up talking over each other. Okay, okay. so Rogan can't interact or steer <laughs> steer the conversation. So they ended up talking over each other. But the essence of his his talk was that he was appalled that we have given away so much money to the pu- the public sector during this pandemic it's, to make people feel good or to buy votes, either direction. Yeah, sadly, probably more of the latter, to be honest with you. But it's just, man, the amounts of money, too, are just, that made me shake my head the other day. You know, over the, over the weekend and over last week, they're trying to come up with this new stimulus bill to come and... Agreed to this. 600 to 200 and then when he ended up at 400 right that, but that what happened they they were talking and and i believe it was Pelosi went and did an interview afterwards and she said with a straight face and being just matter of factly we were willing to go up a trillion or no excuse me, we were willing to go down a trillion dollars if they were willing to go up a trillion dollars 
it's just that is wow. It's monopoly. Wow. It's monopoly money. <laughs> it's yes. It's and there are. It's it there. It used to be with the B, like right? That. Well, the, the, it used to be monopoly talk in the eighties, nineties, and two thousands when it was a B. There's a B in front of that. Illion. Right now, there's T's in front of that. I know. There's billions. some really neat graphics to throw up on a uh, like a screen in class really quick to give a sense for you know how much you know like how big is the American economy? That's about twenty trillion dollars. Like, do you guys appreciate? Like, let's see. And so you. You know, it's like this little square, this little pixel represents a million, and then this big old thing represents a billion, and this huge thing represents a trillion. It's just, mm-hmm. it's it's important to realize just how much the scale, money that is. right? It's a yes. proportional scale, and right. that's and I, and I don't think, I don't think the average citizen. Number one, I don't think the average citizen cares because we have developed a culture now where it really is about me. This is the selfish, in my opinion. This is the most selfish that the world citizenry, if I can pronounce that correctly, is. <laughs> That it really is about what is in it for me. An altruistic view of life has never been so diminished as it is today. And that's a sad thing to say. I know it, that that makes it feel like we're headed toward a dystopian future. I don't believe that. But really, it goes back to that theory that all politics is local, right? And I mean really local. Like, what's happening at the dinner table? <laughs> and I think that that's really that's a shame. It and, is. And I it, mean, if I could do nothing else, you know in class at least appreciating that when someone is talking about spending trillions of dollars like what that means you know at the, the end of the day just the it. scale of the this scale of it because now like you said like you know 50 billion dollars for this that is a tremendous amount of money that is a drop in the bucket related to just the amount of spending that's going on and there's a right there's you know <laughs> there's a there's a there's a problem with spending that much money that will come to bear if if the spending yeah. problem is not going to be dealt with let me ask you a, a question about taxation a general question just to get your thoughts because i've never asked anyone in your field this does it does it bother your academic sensibilities or is it more of a moral question the tiered tax structure in this country um ask that what's what i'm trying to see exactly what you're getting at with that question how would you ask that so before? so i find it so highly, we have progressive- i find it highly ridiculous that that regardless of income or regardless of achievement or earnings or whatever that we have a tiered tax structure being that the more you make sure. you pay a higher percentage a progressive tax system. I, pre- yes not, not a fan of that word. Because <laughs> there's so many, there's, there's so many there's connotations. And there's progressive. Yeah, and and I, yeah from your, from in your world, a, there is. And that's factually. That's just a, but, that, but those two words are completely. That's objective. That's yes, not a subjective yes, word. That's are. an objective word. That's yes, just they, what we yes, call it. Yes, they are. But, you're, but, from, but yes, from an academia standpoint, you're correct. I would agree. Yes. I don't understand. I, I, since, a, since I was old enough to really start paying attention in the early 80s, I've never understood how that was quote unquote uh akin to the word fair as it's used in this country because sure. that doesn't sound fair to me right i mean certainly in the in the moral sense you know why am i getting increasing percentages of what i've earned taken away from me you know as Based i earn my more. achievement I, I there's certainly an argument for that um and again like i mentioned earlier for me i guess that helps me understand this is there's certainly a politically very uh popular not popular it's it's politically feasible to set up a system like that um the Where argument did that come from do you know the history of that at all not off i don't not offhand it's something i probably should know to be honest with you um i do know that i was like saying this in class i you know we kind of introduced you know i said do you guys understand how income taxes work and most of them have a sense for this and you know as you earn higher amounts the marginal tax rate gets higher and so, you know, you pull up whatever the most recent tax code is and just put it on the board and you can work through a problem because they need to understand how to calculate all that stuff. And and then you kind of can have a one-off and you say, look at this very top tax bracket. I actually don't know what it is right off. Is it 37 right 37, now? 37, think, okay. Yeah. So that Used means- 60 or something, right? Well, it, 100 maybe? Even better. Yeah. Um, or worse, I guess, depending how you look at it. I say, so 37%. So you earn a dollar at, you know, let's say you earn your millionth dollar. How much of that are you keeping? And they, you know, okay, 63%, fine. I said- do you know what the highest that percentage has ever been? And it was actually right after World War II. They set it up to 94%. I believe it was 94%. And they and they kind of they go, wow, that's loud. And they say, work through it, right? You earn a dollar. How much of that are you keeping, right? Six cents of that, right? Now, that didn't end up impacting, but maybe people have written papers on that. That was designed to impact like maybe a couple hundred people. It actually right. really didn't, because right. if you adjust for the inflation and everything like that, right. income was really, really, really high. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, um, it was 94%. I, I also read... 
or maybe someone had had mentioned to me, but I believe when they were trying to push that through, they wanted it to be like 99.9%, I believe, or 99% or even like as high, which I always kind of snarkily say in class, I go, well, I mean, what's your 94? I mean, what's (laughs) what's 99 at this point, right? Right, right. Right. Well, where where were the economists then? I mean, where were they seated at the table? They weren't at the table when decisions like that were being made. They couldn't be. (laughs) I'm sure they could find people back then that would be arguing for that as as being... um, as being uh, productive and as being uh, socially beneficial to society, whatever, yeah. whatever that is going to mean, and whatever yeah. justification. And that's where, and that. that's the whole thing. It's it's human emotions versus not science, but uh, statistical facts, right? And where, where's the happy medium in there somewhere? Yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, you know, you could find an economist that would argue for just about anything. So while yeah. my specific historical knowledge of that is probably not up to the point where I should be talking about it here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm certain they, they, they found people at, at, at the time that were saying, yeah, this is, this is a wise thing to do because it's going to make us better off. Yeah. So let's talk sports because part of your background. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to, now let's get a little deeper. So help me understand the work that you have done with, I understand the basics of it, but you have, you you've, you've written papers and you do work in sports wagering. Love doing wagering. Is your work more conceptual, or is, is it everything? Conceptual meaning that we should be gambling, we shouldn't be gambling, we, you know, or is it more about the ins and outs, the statistical, like Moneyball? Um, it's so the wagering market stuff I do is certainly not going to take a moral stance on whether we should be wagering or whether we not wagering. Okay. What I kind of do and what I find really, really interesting is the degree to which we could describe these markets as being efficient or not. Um, no, for the for the rest sure, of us, what does sure. that mean? <laughs> so we spend a lot of time in economics, for better or worse, talking about equilibrium and efficiency and stuff like that. So you know, if you think of like you know principles microeconomics or econ one hundred and one or whatever class, you know, you start getting into those you know supply and demand diagrams pretty quick. Again, for better or worse, and you know we draw them and we say oh, where they cross and there we've got our equilibrium and all that. Right. And it's interesting that we could start there. That's like week three of the first econ course you take, at least in my class, it's like week three, we kind of start diving into that and how we can think about markets. It's amazing to me that something that happens so early in your economics education is really, at the end of the day, difficult to test, right? Like think about the markets for like strawberries or something. You go to the store and you see a price for strawberries. Is that an equilibrium price? Is that not an equilibrium price? That's a really hard question to answer actually at the end of the day so many factors you need to control for and even then the assumptions you make about there's just a lot believe it or not goes into that question right what i love about wagering markets is we can come up with a concept of efficiency that is the following whenever we have a line um you know you go to the sports book and you can see kind of different kinds of lines sometimes you see like a point spread so if you want to bet on a football game maybe the steelers are six point favorites against the Bengals or something like that and then you could bet um there's a different type of wager. It's called a money line wager, which um, I'm not sure how much into the weeds we want to get here. But if you have a, a a a point spread wager, you could bet on the Steelers or you can bet on the Bengals, and what you're going to win is the same on either side if you're right. So if you bet, you know, usually it's I bet twenty dollars on the Steelers. If I win, I get I win eighteen on top of that, so they pay me thirty eight dollars. Right, right. But if I bet on the Bengals and I'm right, it's twenty and thirty eight. In baseball and and other sports too, but in baseball they have these things called money line wagers, yes. which um, what matters for my work is that you don't get the same payout. Um, you know, if you bet the Pirates, who are not doing terribly well right You'll now, do well. They win. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you will get a higher payout. Maybe right. you'll get two to one on right. your bet if you bet on an underdog and they win versus uh, if you bet on a favorite and they win. That's why so, I never bet baseball because I was young. I really could, didn't understand it. I, I don't think I understood the risk. Sure. Um, so what we can do is when you get these money line pairs, so for example, a, a money line could be like plus 160 minus 170. And, um, what does that mean? It means that, um, <laughs> it means that for the team that's plus 160, for every unit that you bet on that team, if they win, you get paid back 1.6 units. Okay. For the team that's minus 170, you need to bet 1.7 units to win one unit if they right. win. So it's right. it's and that's generally how baseball is wagered, correct? Primarily how baseball is wagered. That and over under wagers, which can also have a little bit of a money line aspect to them too. Okay. But, so we do that for baseball and for each pair. So we've got um, 
plus 160, minus 170, we could actually calculate what the implied probability of winning is for each team. So maybe um, plus 160 has a 40% chance of winning and minus 170 has a 60. The line implies those odds, right? And so what we could do is we could take all those wagers that have ever happened at plus 160, minus 170, all those games, thousands of games over all the years, right? And that underdog is implied to win 40% of the time, right? And we can actually look at the results of those games and say, well, do the underdogs actually win about 40% of the time? And what I find amazing is, you know, those lines at the end of the day, yes, there's a sports book involved. And, you know, the sports book, this is a mildly controversial thing to say, but early in the process, people understood sports books as wanting to have, um, no stake in the outcome of the game. Like they want right. to, they want to, right. if perfectly, you know, get as many people betting on the Bengals as many Absolutely. people betting on the Steelers. They want to balance that they out. Want this, yes, yes, there have been many papers now that have shown that books seem to be taking a stake in the action. Nevertheless, to start with, books are responsive to what individual betters are doing. They're trying to achieve some sort of end. The okay. point is, it's not that the book just sets this line because they think it's right. Right? It's that they said it because they think it's right, but then they're responding to what people do. At the end of the day, it's still individual betters like you and me, all acting independently of each other, that are determining what these lines are going to be. Okay. Right? And so it's just for me and, and loving markets and, and doing all sorts of work in markets and championing free markets. This is like the ultimate essence of like markets getting prices right. I mean, it is these markets have been shown to be so, so efficient at right. the end of the day. Right. We could find wrinkles here and there. But by and large, the, the the vast majority of papers, just because the data were more available and go back longer and there's so much more of it, are looking at the efficiency of like horse wagering, right? Paramutual wagering, which is a little bit different. Yeah. Basically, throw all the money into a pot, you bet yeah. on who you think's gonna win, and then all those people that bet on the horse that wins, they get their share of, of the pot. Like they got get it. to take the whole thing. We've got off track gambling, we've got, I mean, People all over the world are betting on races in Australia and Hong Kong and in the United States, everywhere. People all over the world, all over, everywhere, betting on these races. And they end up at a price that is so remarkably near the efficient amount. It's amazing. I mean, it, it's, it's the power of markets as far as I'm concerned. Okay. I try and make that sale. Um, when I started teaching sports economics, wagering was still a little taboo like the kids would come to class i can't believe we're talking about wagering in class like because i have them um you know i give them a hypothetical amount of money and they go do like prop wagering on the super bowl and we'll bet on the ncaa tournament and, you know stuff like that right right and they you know it's kind of taboo and i remember you know a couple times I, I, you're gonna let us wagering to do this and that was you know eight years ago let's say maybe 2012 i think was the first year i taught sports econ and now you know we've got you know sports wagering down at the rivers and you could do it on your phone yep. and now it's very commonplace yep, yep. Um, but it's just I, I've always loved how just the markets it's just for me is the purest evidence of markets working so well I, I just it amazes me that's what that's what I really love about it what why has baseball always been about a money line as opposed to doing like a football but well, how's the football is just based on on score right yeah well, I mean you could do a money line on football too okay. so the most common wagering in football is probably going to be point spread but you could do a money line so and people have tried to connect the two so let's say we do have the Steelers as six point favorites over the Bengals people have done work to say I don't see a money line for that what is that implying like what would the money line be given that it's minus six you know does that like make any sense mm -hmm. those aren't the aren't the best papers in, in the sense that there's footballs footballs football is different from basketball when you have point spreads right okay, because right. we've got these we've got these um thresholds that like matter in football like three is a big one and like seven's a big one a bit less now that yeah, two we've got two point conversion basketball. right two and Generally. three could be there but we don't see those like kind of threshold you know what i mean yeah. there's like you know yeah it might be a thing that you know we see a football line go minus six, minus six and a half. Uh, is it going to make that jump to seven? I know there's a lot of people that kind of focus on that and look at that and think that there's kind of a psychological aspect right, there. Right, right, right. Um, so implying money lines from that isn't necessarily the best thing in football, but they've done it for basketball. Um, and yeah, I mean they, they offer money line. I mean, God, they offer all sorts of stuff now. If you're just even opening up the Rivers app. 
I mean, you know, and you click on football and you click on like the Steelers Bengals game, and there's like a little number in the parentheses on the side, and it'll be like you know seventy eight. I mean, there's like I mean, all sorts <laughs> first half score and money line and first half money line. Coin all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, some students like doing that when I have them uh, do the prop waging for the Super Bowl. They like uh, some students will bet on the coin toss. They get a kick out of that. <laughs> People do it. It's just a, it's, they do. People, there's no data to really. I mean, that's a big question we ask in sports econ too. Is you know why 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 do people gamble we have a we have a wager on the coin toss why are people doing this you know i mean it's a fun question to ask gets their brain. It, what's your thought on that i think so it's kind of different theories i i think it's the following so um you've got so there's this whole kind of wealth aspect of wagering and usually we like to describe people as risk averse yeah and so yeah. um basically the the rub of that story is um we wouldn't expect people to take wagers because basically losing hurts them more than what they'd gain if they won is, is the general rub of that at the end really? of the day. That's what they would... Well, that's the, our, our typical theory of how someone would act would say no one bets, but everyone's betting. So it's got to be something, right? And so what I think it is, is I think people get what, what people call like a consumption value from okay. wagering. So yes, there's the money aspect of it. That's, that's there and that's in play. But I need to add to that this idea that I I get consumptive value out of it. So I, I enjoy I, I like the thrill as separate from the money aspect. I like I, I like that I have the rush. I have something on the game, right? I like that I've got that. That's good and I enjoy that and the endorphins going around and something. I like that a lot. <laughs> or I love saying, um, you know, oh yeah, you know, I, I like calling up my friends, oh I've got this team, I've got the biggest underdog today and now uh-huh. we're gonna win. Like there's something we we usually talk about to start with just in wealth terms but there's certainly something else going on there as well because we see a lot of people wagering right i mean you could also say um milton friedman came up i believe with this one where he said you know maybe over our entire range of wealth right maybe we're risk averse so like i wouldn't want to bet you 10 million dollars on a coin flip i wouldn't like that i'm risk averse to that but there might be some little wiggle room in between that i might be okay with that like eh I'll bet you a dollar on the coin flip because I'm kind of risked. I, I would like to do that, right? Like I'd like this idea of maybe us something on the line, right? I would like that. I'm, I'm risk preferring in a narrow range, but maybe risk averse over like a broad range. Well, I mean, there, it's not you know, it's just different theories of why people are doing this, and there's also other theories out there that are saying <laughs> they're kind of like uh, perception problems where people just really don't understand these are like negative bet. Like maybe you go, maybe you go to 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 the blackjack table. And you honestly believe that, like, if you play long enough, you're going to win because the odds are in your favor. Maybe people think that when they're looking at these wagers, there are actually positive expected value wagers, and those are what they're going after. So maybe that's why people are wagering. Could Doesn't be the house always win, though? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, certainly, <laughs> blackjack, at blackjack, they certainly do. There are, um, well, you know, the guy, um, was it James Holzauer on Jeopardy? Yeah. He yeah, was yeah. a um, sports wager. He lives in Vegas. That's what he does. Wow. Yeah. Guess he's got a little more money to play with now. <laughs> now he does, yeah. It's a, it's, it's such a gambling still t- tends to be a pretty divisive topic in society. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, it's always you know you always see the commercials for the rivers and it's always on the bottom, right? Gambling problem, you know, one eight hundred gambler, whatever the the number is down there. Um, but it's funny, I get when I go and 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 give talks about wagering market stuff or about particular papers that i've done invariably at the end of the day uh usually in reference to the baseball paper that showed you could maybe be okay early in the season betting on stuff they say if you figure this out like why are you why are you still you know, like why aren't you just out there making tons of money doing this right, right, right. i don't like i don't like gambling that much really i don't i don't you know uh, just for fun um you know <laughs> five bucks on a game here and yeah there. I just yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't it doesn't get it for me i, I don't know it's funny that People, people seem to think I'm just out there at the casino all the time, wagering on stuff, spending my research time doing that so I can make more money. I just, I love the market aspect of it. I just love the the prices and the implied prices and just how efficient these markets are. And there's no one person telling everybody what to do. It's all kind of, it's all spontaneous and all organic that we you, get at these really accurate prices. You can put yourself in a, you, I mean, how, hmm. because like you said, as the conversation we had off camera, that someone can look at this and say, well... You have all that statistical data. You can put the odds in your favor. I, I mean, <laughs> past results don't guarantee future performance. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's fun to just from a you know, I've always been a numbers person, and you know, it's kind of fun to get all the data because you know, when we look at at these wagering markets um, in baseball, 
it's like 48,000 games worth of, you know, wager. It's just, it's all of it. It's just all the, <laughs> it's every, every line from every game that's been played since like 1999. That's so incredible. I know. I just, it's just a big old spreadsheet of all this and dealing with it. And it's, it's a pain in the ass to deal with. But there's sometimes. so many variables though. Players come and go, right? I mean, the, right. The, I mean, you know, at least it, as it, it, they were consistent, they were like, you know, automatons that were playing for 30 40 years that would change the dynamic it's i mean it's you could test all sorts of stuff with regards to the data and um people have looked you know it's it's not a big secret that a lot of the lines are driven by the starting pitchers for games um to a large amount and so they went through there and they found they were able to kind of infer the marginal impact of like starting pitchers on right. a game's outcome and right, right, right. remember i think it was pedro martinez in 1999 i think did something like increased and i I, this isn't the number, but it's something. It's like thirty percent. Like he increased the Red Sox chances of winning that year by like thirty percent, implied by the wow. line movements. Right? Wow! It's just like one player of twenty five. Like wow! Just I, I always love minutia and facts and stats and stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's no economics behind that, but it's just it's, it's just funny it's, that that's what they calculate. Is football still the driver? That's the sport that still gets the most. Football and yeah, I, football certainly because there's lots of instances and the NCAA tournament gets a truckload. Of I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I'm curious what. I mean, it's billions of dollars, you know, and that's just the legal stuff, right? <laughs> the next paper, I'm, I'm the next article, um, wagering stuff that I'm looking on is going to be on. Um, um, I'm totally spacing right now. Um, on uh, Calcutta auctions, um, where you basically. So, uh, so for the NCAA tournament, it doesn't have to be the NCAA tournament, but it's the easiest example. You and I and our friends are going to get together and we're going to auction off every single team. Okay. okay. All you know ahead of time is that if a team that you buy wins one game, you get half a percent of the total pot that we got from the auctions. And if a team wins two games, then you get, again, 2% of the pot or three games, you get 5%. So whatever. Th those numbers are yeah. all you know ahead yeah. of time. Okay. Now we start buying teams. How much are you going to pay? Well, it's kind of endogenous, right? Because it's a function of however much people are going to be paying. So you have to try and project that out. Right. Something called a Calcutta auction, which is popular um, in the NCAA tournament. It's also popular for like golf tournaments because you can buy like different golfers, right? And if yeah. you get first place, second place, whatever that may be. Um, and no one's really systematically looked at these. And I was able to, um, I was able to get some data on some auctions like this. Um, that was just getting into it with a student of mine that was doing really, really good work on it um, before all the all the nonsense yeah. hit in March. Yeah. Um, Why Calcutta? There were auctions. Let's see. There were auctions in India in Calcutta for. I want to say it was, it was either like tea or livestock that somehow followed this format. That's where the name came from. I I looked as much as I could, but it is actually from this from auctions of this seem to have historically um, taken place. Um, when Britain was still um, controlling India, and that's how okay. it got the name Calcutta Auction. Okay, stock playing the stock market's an element of gambling for sure. I mean, it's I mean, anything anything where you're taking a financial stake in an uncertain outcome. Yeah, right. I mean, you could even construe it. I you can construe you know, let's say you go to Best Buy and get a refrigerator, right? And they say, do you want the you know, do you want the insurance for it? And you're like, yeah, I'm good. It's just a refrigerator. When you're, kind of gambling there you have yeah. a financial stake in that no doubt about you it you know so yeah i mean anything that you have a stake in the outcome where there's uncertainty i call that wagering absolutely it might take a different form what um what's what's the history of wagering i mean in regards to it's it's become obviously legal in pennsylvania and to a certain degree in the past five years six years is that about right i should i've got these notes but we're late adopters though i mean like we were our state's yeah um so obviously you had you had vegas there for a long time in nevada and it, it appears to be that the variation in states um, that allow sports gambling versus don't allow, there seemed to be, and Pennsylvania is one of those states, there seemed to be um, kind of this legislative buildup towards kind of anticipating that court ruling that allowed state wagering, okay. right? So basically, there had been legislation kind of in the, in, in the state legislature of Pennsylvania that was kind of in waiting like kind of ready to go that when that happened they were kind of like it was all ready to get voted on and kind of out the door so it, it appears the early variation in in states that adopted early were those that were kind of ready if you will for it to happen and just kind of like had the bills written had all that kind of ready to go and then you know it happened and they were able to make it happen pretty quick 
I mean, because you know, people been de- uh, you know gambling with Uncle Charlie down the street. I've got forever, this. Right? I've got I mean, this. I, whenever I introduced wagering in class, I've got all these like facts that I got from this awesome book that I can't remember the title <laughs> of. But um, all these just like one offs, just to kind of get the kids buying into like talking about wagering. So like. Like wagering is older than numbers. I love that. That's like a great one. Wagering so, is older yeah, than numbers. They used to they they have found like thousands of years ago, four thousand, five thousand years ago. These little like they look like domino tiles of numbers. People would throw them and they would bet on the outcome before they actually they would have dots on it instead of like the number three. So like wagering is older than I. Here's my this is my favorite story. So and then I always get sad every year I do this because the kids are getting like younger and younger so <laughs> i say how old are you guys in the year 2000 and they're like oh, i was one you know like something like that right they're they're super great and every every year that happens those numbers keep getting lower right um and so i say all right what do you guys know about the presidential election in 2000 and they say oh you know usually we can get ourselves to bush versus gore and i said do you guys know the state that was you know at you know in the middle of all this in florida okay fair enough i said little and almost lost to history is the idea that there was actually another state that was actually really, really close on votes that year too. Um, Florida was the one that mattered obviously because the, how those votes went, we're going to swing the election Ohio, right? either way. Flo- it was actually, well, the state, I, I'm sure Ohio was close. Um, New Mexico oh, yeah. was actually really, really close okay. as well. Only through electoral college votes. So it didn't really matter too much at the end of the day, but they actually recounted the votes it went, and I don't remember who won, but it went from one candidate to the other. They recounted them, went back to the other one. It flipped back and forth. And the wild thing is, in the New Mexico state constitution, it was written, I think they've since changed it, but it was written that if the candidates got the exact same number of votes, the electoral college would be, uh, the, the, the winner would be decided by a, quote, mutually agreed upon game of chance. Oh, my gosh. Like, how wild would that, and I always say in Costco, how wild Roll would it with be? Ice. No, even better. Like, how wild would it Jarts. be to see, <laughs> to see Bush and Gore playing heads up poker against each other to be president? Like, how <laughs> could that have happened? What was it, the game of chance? Wouldn't have, well, mutually agreed upon. So maybe one side wouldn't have agreed to that. But again. Oh, so that, oh, so, but it was okay. Mutually so agreed upon. Game legally, it could have, if they chose that, it could happen. I, as I'm not a legal expert on, on how we read the Constitution, but that's the the half joke, half possibility yeah. that I make in, in class. Yeah, and, that, and there's a lot of funny rules in regards to elections, in regards I to know, states. I know, you know I know. I was, um, Yes, there are. <laughs> we don't need to go down that. Path. No, just state, <laughs> states. Yeah, state charters and state constitutions and states. I, li- I lived in I lived in California when they did that recall election where Gray Davis was recalled. Yeah. That's how Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah, was elected. Yeah, I remember. And it was humorous because there were only two questions on the ballot. Right? It was should you should recall yes or recall no. Right? And then I think independent of of what happens up top, who do you vote for? in place if you know who we're going to place the governor with, oh it was right? on the same ballot okay the problem was they hadn't um my understanding of it is they hadn't updated the recall they'd updated the portion of the constitution in order to like like the number of signatures you needed to get a recall right what they didn't update was the number of signatures you needed to get your name on the ballot to be the person that you're like replacing you needed a really low number. It was like 500 or 1,000. It was really, really low. Well, how so there big was like, was that pool? There was like 200 people there. Oh, it was, my gosh. Oh, I know. And so then it was a big deal on... Positioning. All of a sudden, the order matters, right? Because, you know, let's imagine a presidential election. You've got, you know, all the different 10 names, whatever, 10 pairs that you're choosing from. Okay, you're all on the same page. Ordering's mm-hmm. probably not that big of a deal, mm-hmm. but being on the first page versus being on the fourth page is... <laughs> it's like placement in a grocery store, right? They pay for that, right? <laughs> no, so... They had a whole, I can't, I think they randomly drew a letter and then they just went like alphabetically from, you know, K or whatever. And then like all the way back through. What about, um, the statistics, you know, statistics encompasses everything, but do people wager on like political elections? Do they wager on like different decisions coming in society beyond uh, sports? Yeah. I mean, there, there are. I mean, you could, there are, the wagering markets do exist. They're usually like futures markets that okay. exist with regards to, um, you know, which president's going to win or this or that. Cause on, on the day of the 2016 election, you know, given the price of the future oh, for, um, Hillary Clinton was trading as high as like 87%, I believe on the day of the election. How about that? Yeah. And well, it's also a good, um, statistical exercise for the students as well. Right. Does that imply that we got the wrong outcome? Right, it's kind of like, do we look at probabilities before the fact or after the fact? 
right? A lot because a lot of people look at that and say, "Well, the wrong thing happened," right? And it's not necessarily that, right? Because there's still a thirteen percent chance of that happening, right? And and if they can't get around that, you say, "All right, um, you know, let's let's roll a die." There's six sides, so you have a one in six chance of each. Right, so something's going to come up that's going to be what's one in six, like seventeen percent, something like that. Right, something that was seventeen percent just happened. <laughs> I, I bet it'll happen again if I roll again. Something I get it. I so get it. it. They're good tools. That's one thing I um, try to get students to think in like probabilities. I think is a is a good way. Um, I went through a book by you know, Andy Duke, the poker player. Yes, from yes. She wrote a book because yes. she was a PhD student. I don't think she finished. She was a PhD that. student in psychology. And so she wrote a book a little while back that I read that's um, I think it's called Thinking and Probabilities. And it's just a, um, I feel like it was something I'm like, God, I'm so glad she wrote this. I've been thinking of like how to express this, but thank you for writing this because this is like how to express it. So trying to think of, you know, it's, world's not a black and white place. There's probabilities no. of a lot of things happening. And the sooner you get more comfortable thinking about probabilistic things happening, then I think you, you can make some headway. Poker is definitely different in that <laughs> there's so much more to the equation than just the luck of the draw of the cards. Sure, sure. There's you know the human behavior and the and, and all that. Um, or any histories you have with players, stuff like that. Absolutely, no poker's but, but um, that goes into, poker's great. But, I love but, playing but poker. that goes into in similarities in regards to matchups and so forth with you know, sports gambling. Like take baseball for example. You know, Mike Trout might be a three forty hitter that year, but he's batting like. 217 with this particular pitcher and this kind of variables which you know i'm not saying that the average baseball fan or the, the, who's gambling doesn't pay attention to that stuff i mean the, the the big stuff they pay attention to but the nuances either don't have the time or the understanding of how to get that information there's a lot of nuances that the average gambler who's might be betting lots of their disposable income on sure can't get yeah i mean that you know if 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 the book believes that to be the case, that's an argument that has been made that the book then may want to take a a a stance in a particular wager in a particular game, right? So we we initially were of the understanding that books just want to be risk free. I just want to know that regardless of the outcome of the game, we're going to get you know some sort of commission off this, you know, because I'm balanced on the both juice. sides, right? But now, if we believe we have a a lot of like if 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 a book and they have a lot of people studying a lot of things with a lot of models on setting these lines if the book feels that they can you know over the long haul take a stance on certain types of games that will tend to make them better in the long run there seems to be behavior and and evidence of behavior that books are are starting to take stances in some of these games stances in the sense of setting the line let's say they believe there to be a 40 percent chance of a team winning they have reason to believe that they could set it at 35 and be or 45 or you know whatever it is in the particular dynamic and and end up better off in the long run it's an industry that never sleeps right it just <laughs> perpetually just goes i mean you know it's, so it, it, it's markets it's sports it's it's i don't know it's it's something that i've always liked looking at even if i don't go and participate too much so <laughs> uh, if you were in in Forgive me, because I have never placed an actual legitimate bet in my life. I mean, when I was a young man, you know, different Uncle Charlie, right? But if you called Vegas the place to bet on a Super Bowl, there are any place that, you know, and they took your bet on a Thursday before the Super Bowl, and the quarterback falls down the stairs the night before the game and breaks their foot, is that bet you place revocable? Are there, I mean, are there... Are there safeguards uh, put in place for either side? Um, if it were if it were that big of a deal, um, and my fifty bucks doesn't matter to the to the, to the book. Well, I mean, it, I mean, so it's the Super Bowl, and if you know Tom Brady breaks his leg walking down the stairs the morning of, right? Right. Generally, what I would guess would probably happen there is, in order to save face, the books would probably say, "We're just going to cancel the wagers because they can this do is that." Huge. They can do that. They can, they can cancel any wager they want. Absolutely. Absolutely they can. Um, Does that happen? Uh, it, it, not frequently. It, it, it can. Um, try, I'm, I'm not getting an example necessarily coming to mind. Um, it, it can. Um, people pulling out of golf tournaments. Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm, okay. They, they, okay. You, we could... I'm sure I could poke around and, and find, you know, something happening like that recently. But, and, you know, I mean, you know, books can cancel wagers if they see weird things happening. Like, you know, if we see, you know, like match throwing and stuff like that, we're betting on Slovakian boxing, fourth level tennis. And all of a sudden you see like 
chunk of money come down heavy with their, no, we're canceling this we're not getting involved in this something weird's going on here we don't want to be at stake so they can well, cancel a smaller measures. event can be can be really be affected by one particular better right it's also fun to tell the students too when we do kind of a lawn econ cheating performance enhancing drugs angle um you know what sort of sports scenarios would you expect match fixing to be most likely you know so like imagine it's the you know start at the top let's say um the nfl right or pro sports just in general um how much you know i'm making a pretty decent salary you know i might be making millions of dollars am i going to risk that to try and throw one game you know and then you go down to maybe um college level right is it super top college level stuff uh, maybe i'm trying to make the nfl i don't want that stigma i don't want to get caught maybe find not so high level where right. people are it's just it's fun to play the game of you know just again with everything there's costs and benefits and there's risks and you're weighing that and just let's get to the point where maybe it starts evening out, right? Pro stuff. Now, that's I think why it was so surprising with the um, with the ref. Was it Tim Donahue? Yeah. In the NBA again. Then again, that's a ref. That's not a player. Um, surprising to see that at such a high level when there's just a lot of money going around in the first place. Surprising to see. I don't know what refs make though. That's actually a good question. So maybe not. Maybe we'd more likely to see that with refs and and umpires in pro sports than we would with the athletes. Hmm. Just the cost is, and is there like take something like the lottery, like the, like the daily number in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. the daily three, right? Yes. Sure. Is there ways to do statistical data on that? In terms of like what probability of what these numbers hit in these particular positions? Well, I mean, if 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 we assume that everything is on the up and up, yeah. and everything is you know, there's no weighted balls, and every, we're really just randomly drawing. I mean, that's pretty early statistic stuff, just in terms of no Nick Perry incidents, right? Remember, <laughs> no, well, was that? long before your time, oh, okay. probably. <laughs> I was a little kid. Nick Perry, I think, fixed the Pennsylvania lottery. Did he really? I th- yeah, weighted the balls down or something, and end up, and he just went, he went and cashed out, and expected not to get caught. Oh, that's geez. a historical fact in Pennsylvania. Really? Nick, I've never Nick heard of that. Perry was his name. Yeah, yeah, because it's always on. Um, it's always on right before Jeopardy, right? They got the, the kids love that. Know, they love the watching the balls. I don't know if the number was six 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 or three oh, six geez. three or something, but the sixes and the threes, I think, are, I, my memory's a little foggy. It always on it, seems like the sixes come up more than the nines, but that's probably just what I want to see. Well, I, I took. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I remember I was in high school and I took. Um, I somehow got a hold of the statistical data over like a f- five year period of the daily law, and I just manually counted what each digit, and I came up with like four. Six five. Yeah, the four would hit in the first position the most in, in five years, and the six would hit in the second position in the five. And I played that for like a year, never, won. <laughs> I never won. I think it, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it's the same reason that casinos put up the like most recent results on roulette, right? Is yeah, people go over there and they see, right? Yeah. They, they do a couple of things. They either see what seems to be hot, or look at that, <laughs> or what number have I not seen for a while and do that, right? They're all independent events, so you know anything that gets you off your game, they're uh, they're all for that. But that's it, why they put it up. There. Is it the why hmm, the games would not be created if there wasn't a way for the creator to make money? Sure. No matter what the game, no matter yep. what the sport, no matter what the variables are, right? So, what is it about the human psyche? Do you think that? And again, you know, I realize you know psychology is not your background, but just your opinion. Like, what is it? What is that tangible thing that keeps us doing it? Is it the lure that it, the next time's going to hit? The next one's going to be right. We're going to be right. We're going to be mentally right eventually. Right, and and you know again, it's it's back to that consumption value kind of angle. It's not, you know, you buy a lottery ticket for the Powerball and it's five hundred million dollars or whatever it is, right? And like, you know, the probability so it's low. very low. But that's not the there's there's a wealth angle to this, but there's also a consumption value to this, right? You buy the ticket and you let yourself think for a minute, what would it be like if I actually won, right? Could you make the argument that you might actually be better off buying that one Powerball ticket even if you don't win? Yes, you have a couple bucks less. But do you like to buy the idea of you enjoying a dream for five minutes? Okay. I think so you could make that so argument. we're buying that emotional connection, could that be. emotional feeling. Could be. I mean, you know, the the you know the answer is no. I mean you have a you know, all those you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning than you do, you know, all those mm-hmm. statistical kind of probabilities. Especially the Powerballs, like the, the multi state <laughs> ones, right? right. I mean it's I, just, I know. But you know somebody has to win, and that's what I was always told by my aunts and uncles, the ones who would stand in line. <laughs> well, not, the daily well, not number, the, not the power. Someone ball. has to win. Someone has to win. Eventually, well, eventually, someone yeah, will eventually, win. Yeah, eventually, right? Then, like, and, and whoa, 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 guess that was that's like your favorite sports team uh, outside of baseball that ends in a tie, right? You know, at the end of the night, you wait up eleven o'clock, and then no one wins. 
No one wins. You that's don't have baseball. That's why baseball is the best. Yes, yes, because <laughs> they demand a, they did well except for the All Star game, what ninety four or whatever right. it was, or ninety six or two thousand. It was in Milwaukee too, wasn't it? I think so. What was the commissioner's name back then? Bud Selig. Yeah, and Bud <laughs> and Bud was an owner, wasn't he? He was the Brewers commissioner owner, and owner, right? Go figure. Then he had to, then he was commissioner, and then that All Star game was actually in Milwaukee where he used to be the owner. Unbelievable. I think. I think. Unbelievable. Yes. <laughs> if 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 you were a gambler, if you were a wager. Would you what what pro sport would you be more inclined to gamble um, based upon what you find enjoyable? I mean, only, I would I would say baseball only because that's what I've looked at the most, right? Okay. And just the idea, at least from the paper that I wrote, is you know basically whenever uncertainty is high, bet on underdogs because the payoff's going to be higher. That's that's the basic okay. gist of that story. Okay, okay, um, okay, and it seemed to exist. Um, for the original period that I looked at, and that was fine. And then I waited a few years and uh, made like five or six years, and then I went and looked again to see if anything had changed. It seemed to have gone away. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's what I would do. And I mean, especially in this day and age, right now with what's going on, anytime you could increase the uncertainty, right, and give me a payout that's going to be you know more than one to one, maybe close to two to one. I, I started this uh, just colloquially when I was in grad school with a, a buddy of mine. And I said, I look at the standings. I mean, even the best teams in baseball, okay. they win like sixty percent of the time. There, there are exceptions, but like the good teams win like sixty percent. The bad teams, again, exceptions like the Pirates this year. <laughs> even the bad teams win like forty percent of the time, mm-hmm. roughly speaking, right? Mm-hmm. So there are going to be some lines that are out there that it goes to show you the the the, the overall. Uh, closeness and talent that the major league players generally oh, are, right? It's well, well because it's, it's it's little variables. Yes, the worst teams versus the best teams. Best team wins the first two. Worst yeah. team wins second two. It's the fifth game, yeah. right? It's that it's fifth exactly. Game. Right. I know. So, yeah. I was like, if you're going to give me two to one on a probability of something happening forty percent of the time, that seems to be something that's going to work. Now, that's not you know that's has some assumptions underneath it, right? But I'm like, at face value, let's just track it throughout the year, and so. I said every time there's going to be a wager of plus 200 when we talk about money lines, every time it's going to be plus 200 or more, we'll hypothetically bet on it. And we'll just see let's just see what happens, right? And then I'll uh, buy you a beer if you're right and you buy me a beer if I'm right. Whatever, just over yeah. the course of the season. Yeah. And so the season started out doing great, doing great, doing great. And then after about a month, it kind of went back down, went back down at the end of the season. It kind of ended up being uh, pretty, I don't know, it wasn't very far one way or the other at the end of the day, which we would expect. Again, yeah. these are very efficient markets. Yeah. They get the prices right. Yeah. And so that led to, to writing the paper and seeing what was going on early in the season. And the best it could be described was early in the season, there's enough turnover from year to year that we don't know perfectly who's going to be good this year and who's going to be bad. Okay. So it's funny. The example I use is... Um, Just primarily baseball we're talking about. This right? is baseball. Yeah, yeah, this is baseball. purely baseball. So I go, all right, we, we don't know perfectly. We have a sense, but we don't know perfectly who's going to be good or bad. And I say, think back and I have to tell the kids this because, again, they don't remember. I go, think back to 2008. I go, do you guys know who played in the World Series in 2008? And usually they figured out it was the Phillies beat the Rays. Mm-hmm. I go, I, I can't express to you how absurd it was that the Rays made the World Series this year. I'm like, they had never had a winning team in their franchise history. Right. Ever. I mean, this right. was like out of left field. Right. Yes, they were getting quite a bit of talent and people were suspecting, but this was not expected. And I said, do you guys remember who won the World Series in 2007. They go, the Red Sox did. I go, all right, let's go back to April. There was a three-game series in Fenway Park. Mm-hmm. It was the Rays mm-hmm. at Fenway Park. And I go, let's read the lines for this because you know how the story played out. Mm-hmm. You know, they were really good and the Red Sox were not that good right. that year. Right. Red right. Sox, right. Rays were like plus right. 250, plus 275. Huge underdogs. And they swept the series. Right. Right. So it's like, we don't know who the good teams are. And by virtue of what we just talked about, the nature of baseball itself we don't know for certain. Let's say they win that first game of the series. Is that because the Rays are good, or is that because that's just kind of baseball? Sometimes crappy teams beat good teams. Right. So the updating is slow. So it takes about a month for people to figure out kind of the what's not just noise mm-hmm. and what's actually better teams. Mm-hmm. Right. Like like um, like Miami right now. They have a pretty good record, but they haven't played that much. Is it because they're actually good, or is it just because they haven't played that much, and that's just how the balls bounce? Right. Right. So. And this whole quirky season, probably, right. that's hovering over all so, of it, right? And then combine that with the idea that, you know, I don't really know who's going to win, but you're giving me better odds on one side than the other. And so the analogy I make is, let's say we're going to flip a coin, okay? And I say, I'll give you five bucks if it's heads, and I'll give you a dollar if it's tails. Like, what are you going to bet? I'm going to bet heads, right? Not because you think heads is going to win, but because the return is that much right, better, right? Right, right, right. And so that's kind of the logic behind doing it early in the season. 
Um, and yeah, so, uh, you know, and you can kind of extend that. And we've tried to extend it to other areas with, without a whole lot of success. It would seem to be, if you can get money line wagering anywhere where uncertainty is going to be larger, it would seem to have an underdog kind of slant to it. Right. We um, used to have students write senior theses at Duquesne. They're, it's optional now, but we used to require it. And so I've had a couple kids over the years try and test that with other um, levels of, of sports. So, for example... Um, could you make the argument that uncertainty varies from NBA to high level division one to mid level division one to low level division one to division two to division three? Okay. Right? So if we feel that there exists, you know, um, low level division one, all those um, conferences that send their one team a year, you know, to the tournament and they, you know, lose in the first round, you know, all the, the smaller, smaller conferences. Not always. Not always. But, <laughs> you know, throughout the season, if we're going to be wagering. No, right. Right. The probability of it. Would we think then, if that theory is correct, that we might have more success underdog wagering in these leagues where there's just a lot of uncertainty, people don't know a lot about what's going on, okay. versus the NBA, which is scrutinized to the umpteenth Hilt. degree, right. right? So, yeah, people tried to look at that. The, the problem with that particular analysis is that those wagering markets in college basketball start getting pretty, what we call thin, pretty quickly. They, they don't have a whole lot of participation compared to what you get in like professional sports. So it's a little tough sometimes to track down lines, a little tough to, to try and kind of figure that out. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if you look at baseball this year, mm -hmm. right, it would seem like, I haven't tracked this myself, but it would be easy enough to look at at the end of the year. Um, it would seem that uncertainty would be really high this year. I mean, my Lord, you've got teams that are testing positive. They're changing the schedule like the day before, you know, where you're traveling. Now the Blue Jays are playing in Buffalo. They were going to play in Pittsburgh. They're going to play in Toronto. Like, it just seems like uncertainty is way high. Someone, you don't know if someone's going to test positive that day, and so they have to sit out till they test negative right. a couple. I mean, it just seems like. Sports has never seen this. It just seems like we've cranked the uncertainty through the roof, which would seem at least, you know, and, and maybe. the Martins in first place. <laughs> you know, it, it would seem then that, you know underdogs would make more sense in that situation but then again you know markets are smart and so are books i mean maybe they're responding to that too it's just i just all of this the minutia of this which most people are probably listening to this and just no like, no not at all <laughs> no. i could i, I couldn't I, I just find this i, I just i don't it, know Do well, it's what, insane find well, really it's insane to so a baseball fan who doesn't gamble but is aware of it <laughs> you look at it, the minutia is just it's 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 overwhelming I just find something that, <laughs> you know, everyone says this, right? Find something that you love, right? Uh -huh. and do that as a career. Yeah. And I just I find it endlessly fascinating. I, I'm never upset having to work through data with that stuff. I just find it amazing. I just, I like it. <laughs> do the, it, it, what blows my mind about it is, again, there's just so many variables. I had a, God rest his soul, one of my dearest friends, Mike, big baseball fan and he liked to dabble with um betting baseball and i would live the the experience through him always too chicken shit to lose any money i just don't <laughs> like losing money but i would definitely watch him and, and he would go on these runs which you know there's an element of luck involved in this too but he really would watch the games and study them the best that he could in his in the way he viewed it but he would look at, I mean, who was pitching, what the lineups were, and he wouldn't make his bet until they posted the, the lineup. He really was into it, and he used to say to me, no matter what I think I'm doing right, there's so much more to the story in this stupid game with two teams, one's yeah. in third place and one's in seventh place, And but there's so much more to this I'm missing. I'm just not getting it all. There are I mean, there are people that, that make careers of – you know, being in Vegas, I guess you don't need to be in Vegas anymore, but, you know, mm -hmm. being in Vegas and having their own models. And uh, I remember 60 Minutes several years ago did a story on a on a guy that, you know, bet all the different sports. He's got all his models. I think he focused on football, but he did it 12 months a year. By his words, he supposedly hadn't had a negative month ever. I mean, there are people that do that. Professional gamblers. Yeah. I mean, there there are people that, that can go out there and feel that they can, 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 beat the book if you will or have you know knowledge beyond that or a, a deeper understanding of what's going on and I, the proofs and that's what they've chosen to do and they're still eating so yeah i mean it, to me it'd be easier to pick one sport and immerse yourself in that sport I think, right uh, yeah I, again i think this guy focused primarily on football but just uh, at the level he was at he he was saying something to the effect of and uh you know sports books don't have to take your wagers so he's got this whole phalanx of like people that go places bets for him so they don't know it's like him actually right, placing the bets right 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 he, oh they, they they target winners 
yeah, they don't want to take your. If, if you know more than they I do, for cards just, too. Same thing. Yeah. yeah, of course they don't have. They could. They're a private entity. They don't have to take yeah, your wagers. They don't yeah, have to have you yeah. in their casino. Of course, got it. Of course, they got don't it. want that, right? Got it, right? So he would. He was even so in tune with the models that he had that he let's say, let's say the line was two and a half, and so he would take a bunch of money, give it to one of those guys, and they'd go and they'd bet it at, at there, and, and that that wager was enough to to tick the wager, to move the line, move the line from two and a half to three, and then yeah. he went and bet opposite of that like ten times as much because he wanted the three instead of the two and a half manipulation. Yes, it's 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 something. It's uh, it's something. Not not for me, but that is, is <laughs> that is something. Just from your your research, is boxing? I mean, I know I know the heavyweight boxing has not been the past twenty twenty five years the way what it was decades prior. Sure, but is it still a heavily wagered event? I I think the big ones are. Yeah, I think for certain. So when you get like the you know the Pacquiao Mayweather stuff, oh yeah, I think there's all sorts of people that are throwing a lot of money on that. Um, I haven't looked particularly at boxing myself, um, but they do set up you know. Money line style wagers on those, you okay. know, uh, you know, and you the know. lines move throughout the week or or anticipate and football through the week, right? They do, or up to a fight, it moves, right? Though uh, the wager you get at that time, you know, just like a if if you bet, is you it know, locked in generally? For that, it is. So that's going to be a so if if you bet on the Steelers at minus six, you have your little ticket at minus six, and no matter what okay. happens after the fact, you've got minus six. Okay. Now, when you talk about paramutual wagering, like if you go to a dog track. What is the de- explain the definition of that because I mean going to the yes. I was born on the green as a kid that's what I used to be told because I had these uh, heavily Italian uncles and aunts who would take me and some were probably not even family but they were my all I knew them as Uncle Joe fair enough they would take me to and it was the meadows so there was hor- the harness racing then it was the horse racing in West Virginia so. I spent a lot of time in these smoky rooms with television <laughs> monitors as opposed to actually watching the damn things, <laughs> but I never understood what paramutual meant. So um, the easiest way to talk about it is just a win bet. So you go in and you're just betting on what horse is going to win or what dog, what participant's going to win. That's the easiest. Now you could have a place bet also. Okay, which, which is one, two, or three. First or second show would be one, oh, two, or three. Okay, and uh, for a traditional place bet, it doesn't matter if they're first or second. It's just what you know. It's that satisfies that bet and the show would be first second or third again doesn't okay. matter which just one of those three okay so for a win bet it's easiest just to describe it this way you bet so there's uh we have eight different horses let's say and we've got all these people betting on them and a certain amount of money comes in on horse one and a certain amount on horse two and a certain amount on horse three we pundle all that together into like a pool the track takes their cut from that pool and then what's remaining gets distributed to the horse that wins in proportion to you know how much money. So if you're the Got only it. person that bet horse one to win, and a lot of other people bet a lot, then the track takes their take, and then you get all that. Totally pot. understand. And if it's you and I, we would just split. So it's okay. that's the general gist of paramutual. The rub with that though, and I've been to a couple horse slash dog tracks over the years just to see how this works in practice. You've got wagering that starts on these races. Oh, I don't know. 10, 15 minutes before what they call post time, let's say, while they're walking around the track and doing the thing. So all this money's coming in. And on the board, they update um, with rough odds where the different participants are Familiar. to start with. But you, you, you could walk up there and place a wager and say, wow, that horse, as of right now, is the favorite. And so I want to bet on the favorite because that's right. just what I want to do. You can go up there and you can bet on the favorite that horse could very well be the longest underdog by the time it actually starts and you don't you don't place your wager based on what you see up there you just have a claim to that horse in the wind pot right so all this money could come in late and right. it could end up being a favorite everyone else all this late money comes in the other one so it's it's interesting to you think of sports wagering as okay let me open up my phone let me go down to the rivers and let me go put five bucks on the pirates and that's easy and i know my odds and i'll put the phone that's down. definitive you know what you're you doing you know it not like that with paramutual wagering it's not right. like that at all the the payout's a function of what everyone else does not just mm-hmm. what you do greyhound still a thing <sighs> i went to when i was in grad school we went to wheeling downs i mm-hmm. believe one day uh one night and i i i think um that's the only. That's my only experience. I, I haven't done research with um, uh, dog racing. I've done some horse racing stuff, but high lie, high lie. <laughs> People bet on anything. I, I went I to that in, you in to Miami oh, thirty years ago. Did you really? I just went. I just wanted to go to, to see it, and it was a, like it was a, it was weird. 
But they're betting on it. It's crazy. Oh, I went, we were, um, I was doing a study abroad program in Brazil. Okay. And I was down with a group of MBA students, and we got to this island. I can't remember what it was called. Isabella, maybe? South part of Brazil. And we're on this island, and there was this uh, boat ride they were going to do around the island. And me and another one of the students, um, I get like really motion sick with stuff like that. So I said, I'll be fine. I'll just we'll go walk around the island. It'll be fine. So we walk down this trail and walking around, and we happen upon this little town. And there were students... Uh, like element, eh, maybe not element, maybe like middle school age students that were doing like that were racing in a little small arena. I had no idea what the game was. There were people like actively betting on it. It was awesome to see. It's crazy. The, I know. I remember. Um, I've read um, that in China back in the day, Hong Kong, I think back in the day, they used to bet big time on cricket fighting. Oh yeah, big time, and that's still an underground thing there. Cricket fighting. So I just, I always think, you know, like. I've been to, I've taught in China a couple of times. I'm like, who could I, who could I talk to in China that can get me all this old data on cricket fighting? Because that would be a wait, fantastically wait, wait, fun paper. Wait, wait, wait. Explain to <laughs> me. Cricket fighting. Cricket fighting. Yeah. They Explain like, this to me. They stick them both in a ring, and uh, one of them ends up biting the head off the other one, and that's and they fight them. Yeah, and the people bet on this like six figures. Under, that's it's insanity. underground. They, they like rooster fighting or cock fighting. Yeah, right? basically. Um, yeah, it was um, it was like a big thing. Um, it, it's still like an underground thing there. Every once in a while, you hear about them breaking up underground like rings, and people buy these cricket fighting. Yes, cricket fighting. Cricket, crickets. Yes, like little crickets. insects. Well, they're bigger. But the good ones. Are yeah, bigger, they're but. <laughs> <laughs> good ones. <laughs> That's insanity, though. I know, I and mean, people have been. It's you know more people bet than don't is is the is the line. So it's it's. Um, I don't know. Just writing a paper on cricket fighting would seem really fun. I would think that would be... In, the, be in the history of, of gambling, at what point in human history did it become like a sin or did it become like a vice? That, boy, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Maybe it's something I should know, but I don't know. Um, I, I just know at some point it seemed to... I, I'm sure the church played a role in it at some point, some way along the way. I, I, growing up a Catholic, it was frowned upon. But then we go to these Catholic, Catholic festivals, and they'd be playing games of chance to raise of money course. for the church. So of course. a lot of confusion as a kid, like you know, what really is permitted and not right. permitted, right? Right. No, I know it's. Um, Don't gamble on football with Uncle Charlie. Right. But they're right. down the standing at the at the line buying lottery tickets, and spinning the wheel, right? That gets you a little pet, yeah. It, yeah, I agree. No, I I, I agree. Um, it's amazing. I, I also impress this upon the students too. You know, now when you see that little ticker going across the bottom on ESPN, it'll it'll give you you know the money line for the baseball games. It'll right. give you the point spread, and it'll give but you that's a recent phenomenon. It is. Right? Well, what I try and say and is like embracing it. I said even I go imagine to your like earliest memories of sports, maybe like for them like two thousand five, two thousand six. I tried to think back then, and even then. Can you imagine if like ESPN just one day unannounced started putting wagering stuff? I mean, even think about it in the eighties or the nineties. No, imagine they would just the uproar because yeah. of the public perception of of wagering. What changed being, that? What was the event? More states just legalizing it? Uh, um, there, there was a landmark decision. There was. That, oh, right. Well, that that was the legal one. I think that was out of the state of New Jersey, I believe. Okay. Um, sued for the right to be able to do and sports. They and they won. They did, and. Um, that that's what that's what got but see that didn't happen until it was like 20, 20, 2017, 2018 it was, it was pretty recent right yeah. because this it's only been a season or two we've been able to bet on our phones well not only that I noticed too which a little I know this is going to sound like crazy but um, a little part of me died when I when I would listen to my baseball podcast or I listened to my my talk radio host that I like in or out of the state of Pittsburgh, when they started really concentrating on the lines, like, you know, listen to the fan now, they talk openly about the lines sure. because the Rivers is a sponsor for the show. Absolutely. I, I don't want to say I felt dirty. That wasn't the right <laughs> word to use, but it really it was almost like um, I, I don't want, as a sports fan, maybe I'm just a traditionalist, but I don't want gambling to be the linchpin at least publicly, that keeps people interested in baseball. And I think that people are going to like football no matter what. We know there's wagering. But if you took the wagering away from football, there would still be a fan base there. I'm at the point now where I think baseball needs gambling because I think it's, yeah, I think there's been an ebb 
in popularity over the years. I don't know why outside of maybe it's just the pace of it. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I think gambling is almost needed now, especially in baseball. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a question that all the leagues are asking. And to put it in econ terms, it's, you know, is, is sports wagering a, a complement or a substitute for the, the experience of taking in a game? Is it something that enhances? Like, is it something I could do along with watching the game that makes me like it more? Or is it something that I do in place of watching the game? So, like, if, if I um, – would I rather – if it's a substitute, do I either decide to go to the game or do I decide to wager on the game? Mm, right. And so sports, you know, obviously there's a there's a lot at stake for sports to figure that out. If yeah. It's a compliment and something yeah. that enhances it, or yeah. you know, somehow we could, um, you know, in game wagering at the park or something somehow somehow something that enhances the ballpark experience. Then maybe that's something that teams look into. What turned me off when I was surrounded by a teenager and maybe in my early 20s where I was surrounded by a lot of my friends who were gambling on everything. Sure. And I just didn't partake in it. It was odd to me because I was just starting to really follow college basketball and really kind of understanding the game. Never grew up with it. And then I would go to places with these folks, and it really wasn't about who won the damn game. It was like right. the over-under. And when I... Or there was a, a teaser, you know, or sure. whatever the arrangements were. But the the victor was not the central point of focus for them watching this. And I'm watching a game to see who flipping wins because that's the essence of sports to me. Sure. So I think it was, you know, looking at a number as the goal. It was disassociated from the event of the game. Is sure. That, can, is that, am I articulating that right? Yeah. I mean – Certainly, I mean it's it's a question of if everyone else is doing that, does that inhibit your ability to still watch the game and see who's going to win at the end of the day? It did. I mean, to, it, it I mean, did if, to me if when it's I went in front of you. Certainly, I mean, I could if I went to a game like uh-huh. a pirate game, you know, in the uh, uh, late eighties, early nineties, they had a run there, and I had friends that were upset because oh, we won the game, we beat the Reds, but they're pissed off because they took the over <laughs> in a baseball game. And I was—I knew what an over was, but sure. that, it, it took something away from the experience of being a fan. Sure, I know that's probably—I can see where you're not coming cool from anymore. I mean, but I mean I, it's such big. I'm business, with you. Though. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I like to see who's going to win. You know, I don't really bet on anything myself, so I mean, I think it's interesting after the fact to see how the markets behave. But no, I'm with you on that. Case one. in point, I took my son to the A's game. We talked about last year it was the wild card game against the Rays, and we lost. We flew out there. Last minute, the, the joy of going to the stadium. I don't know what the under over. I don't. I have no idea what the statistical data was on that game. I sure. could care less. But had they lost by one run, maybe in the bot or maybe in the bottom of the thirteenth, and I would have seen fans mad because or happy because they covered leaving <laughs> there. There'd be something in, something innately wrong with an Ace fan being happy because they covered. I'm upset they lost, but aren't you there to watch your team win the game? Right? I know. Um, I know of a couple of friends of mine that and they love talking about this, and I think it's hilarious. They do the, what they call the emotional hedge, where um, okay. let's say you're a big A's fan. So you bet on Tampa to win. So either way, either the A's win or uh, your bet wins. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have worked with me. I yeah, would have no. been so different jaded people and angry. Are wired different ways. No, I, I, I get I, a kick out of that, though. No, I understand. Is I haven't seen the NFL embrace it, at least not on their broadcasts, not on their pregame shows. I think the NBA was really the first one to kind of come out, and I think it was Adam Silver. I think that was the first one to kind of. It wasn't you know taboo to talk about anymore, and you know. Are they doing it now on the sanctioned NBA sh- pregame shows? Um, I, to be honest, I, I don't really watch don't watch I don't watch NBA either. Um, that I don't know, but I just I do know Adam Silver. I think was the first one to make public statements about wagering on games. It wasn't like he was it wasn't taboo to talk about anymore because you know I mean any major league baseball commissioner that talks about this. You know, you got to realize they've got, you know, the Mm -hmm. 1919 World Series is in history. Pete Rose is in history. So it's like anytime a commissioner is going to talk about wagering or anything like that, at least specific to baseball, slippery slope, there's just a lot, there's just a lot of historical baggage there that, you know, threaten the game, you know? And so it's a little, I feel a little different for the NBA to talk about it or the ability of them to talk about it than baseball. There's been moments in my life uh, growing up, I can tell you, Dandy Don used to do Monday Night Football in the 70s, He was, along with uh, Howard Cosell and um, uh, I 
can't remember who else, but there were times once in a while, a com- usually a color commentator would slip up toward the end of the game and say, and, and when a, a team was beating another, shellacking another team, like I can remember a Dolphins game with Marino in the mid '80s where he covered. And they were, and it, there's always a comment that'll slide yeah. in. So it, it isn't like it's never mentioned, but it was always an innuendo. Right. And I still don't hear it today. Talking about covering the spread, well, they made a lot of Dolphin fans happy with that one. You get, you might get that once in a while, but it seems like it's a no-no. It seems like a no-no in baseball, right? At least on the live broadcasts. Yeah, I don't hear much mention of that on live broadcasts or even watching hockey games or I, I don't I haven't heard much of that um, I do know what, does that go to the integrity of the game it, I mean the experience could be I mean I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know the reason we watch sports is the reason that you identified right is winning and losing winning and losing and uncertainty in the outcome right I don't Absolutely. know what's going to happen That what's kind of what keeps me glued to the screen that's why and I'm watching it now with cut, uh, cardboard cutouts and, and you know <laughs> and, and piped in fan noise I'm still watching I wish the I w- Pirates would have I would have absolutely given to whatever charity they want to get one of my cardboard cutouts there absolutely why not I don't, mm-hmm. I did you see they put um where was it in Bartman, Los Angeles Chicago they put did Bartman they, <laughs> they put Bartman in there they put um Weekend at Bernie's was that in Kansas City? Uh, Kansas City. <laughs> there's been um, so there's been the uh, Oakland Oakland even sanctioned this. They got a um, a cardboard cutout of the Astros mascot Astro holding a garbage can. That was front and center when they just came to town. That is Oakland fantastic. Them, by the way, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's been yeah. So I mean. Yeah, there's some uh, some stadiums too. Um, Bartman, <laughs> you could, yeah, that's something. That's great. Did they put him like in that seat? Like, right? T- <laughs> I have to watch for that. That's really funny. Headphones on, oh, yeah, the jersey, everything. God, they um, <laughs> some places you could pay. So uh, there was an article that about half the teams are doing something like this, I think, and you could pay. You know, it's fifty bucks if you're in the upper deck, yeah. or a hundred here, or whatever, and it goes to the charities. And there, one team was doing something where. You could you could almost choose where you wanted to put it, and if a home run hits your ball, oh yeah, or if a foul ball hits it, you win like some prizes and stuff. I think the Giants, like, kind of fun. The Giants or the Dodgers just in this today. But I think Oakland was the first stadium with the cutouts. I though. think you're right. I know when I read was, that it article, was laughed out, uh, they were laughing stock for a while. Um, what else did they? Oh well, in um, if you ever watched any of those Korean games that were being played before they started, they had all they had like plush toys in the <laughs> seats, and it was it was bizarre. <laughs> like it was it was it was. It was. It made me laugh. I think it's hilarious. But I, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Is baseball or some broadcasts um, digitally putting fans in, or is that hockey? One of the one of the two sports started digitally some stadiums, superimposing fans. Some in. stadiums in baseball, and it's it's straight out of like a two thousand two video game because it's they can't. It's it's bizarre because the the center field camera, they either are not letting them do it or can't do it. Probably not letting them do it. So you've got a batter. No one behind him, picture no one, no one there, and then all of a sudden, there's other camera angles that allow the virtual fans. So now all of a sudden, we've got these weird virtual That's fans. That's very strange. It is, and it's glitchy. Maybe they're trying to, you know, improve. Obviously, I mean, technology is going to improve on how they do this stuff. But it's it's really funny because sometimes, you know, like a player will walk, but the camera will like impose fans on top of. Like, it's it's just kind of yeah, funny. Just the, the glitchiness of it. Yeah. Marl- Marlins man is in Oakland stadium. Did I, you see that? I put that, I put a Marlins that on, man. I put that on Facebook yesterday. I said, is, did Marlins man buy one of those behind home plate? Of course he did. And I he said, if he did, that's absolutely fantastic. He probably did it in every stadium. I wouldn't doubt it if he's not in that seat. In that would stadium. be or that, everyone that allows him. Marlins anyway. man. Yeah, I know. I'm like, cause, I'm, cause it's the orange with the visor. And I'm like, is he, I'm like, I put that on Facebook yesterday. Wasn't well, there a team that tried to, to again, to change jerseys? I, um, last year or the year before. So the owner of, uh, this is a very random connection. Angels or was the, the owner of the Diamondbacks is a West Virginia university alum, or at least one of the owners, okay. um, Ken Kendrick. And, um, he has given money to the business school there and, and the economics program and all of that. And so some people that worked there, um, long story short, got to know the guy. And so he had them out to go to a Diamondbacks game at one point and gave them really good seats, you know, behind home plate. His rule was, though, you could wear neutral stuff. You could wear Diamondbacks stuff, but you can't wear, unless they're playing the Pirates. You can't wear Pirate stuff. Like that, no, 
no negotiation. Okay. Like that's what it is. So I could imagine there being some owners out there that maybe prohibited that. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if the Diamondbacks did that just from that story. They can do it. They own this. It's a private entity, like, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> yeah, it's stadiums publicly owned, but for the private use of the franchise. So, <laughs> you know, and, and in public tax that's a whole dollars. Not, that's, yeah, a whole that's a whole podcast. other podcast. There's no question. The, um, your, does your gut tell you we're not going to have college football period this fall? I if, if I had to wager on it, I, I I would say I don't think we're gonna have it in the fall. I just it's the the consistency, it the optics of it. I can't remember if we talked about this already, yeah. but just the optics of having a bunch of players out there playing a sport all right next to each other doing their thing when classrooms are so distanced and everything like that. I just I I, I that's a discontinuity. I, I think they're going to move it to the spring. Would be my guess. It's not like those stadiums are being used for anything else. If this, so, hear me out. If if all this stuff does get postponed to the spring, then does the season end and then the summer happens and then a, a month's off and they start on providing that we're providing we're in a different place COVID wise. Sure, sure. As right. a society, right? Yeah, because what you're seeing it's in Europe ridiculous. What you're seeing in Europe for soccer is uh, they, you know, they shut down for a while and then they they went back up and they've now finished the domestic leagues you know yeah. like the italian yeah. league's done and the spanish yeah. and the english league those are all done and now they're they're finishing up what's called the champions league so they take like the best teams from all the leagues from the previous year and they like play them off in a tournament that's just finishing up uh they're in like the quarterfinals right now so they're going to finish no fans, that up. right correct right so um that'll finish up in like a week or a week and a half or however long it's going to take for them to finish that up mm-hmm. there's been articles you know, because training starts up for the next season in like three or four weeks. Yeah. So they're talking about, you know, there might be some teams that are going to be adversely affected by literally not really having a summer. Yeah. Granted, they weren't playing for the last several months, but we're not, you don't think society would actually now flip and keep it that way. Even once we, yeah, we'll go back to the normal sk- schedule, right? I would, would you, think so. Yeah, I would think so. Um, you can't play baseball in the winter. <laughs> no, not, not in Pittsburgh anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that would. It's just a one-off. It, it seems to be everyone's just kind of nodding to each other and saying, "This is this is a one-off. This is weird. This is a one-off, and we're going to figure out, you know, how to get a World Series champion after sixty games with sixteen teams in the playoffs. We're going to figure out how to get an NBA champion by sticking everybody in Orlando. You mm-hmm. know, we're going to figure out how to get an NHL title with people in Toronto and Edmonton. So, you think it was worth it in the end, or would it would have been pragmatic <laughs> just to just I mean, to I understand bag what, the year. I mean, not for the balance sheets for those guys at the end of the year. I mean, they, I mean, it's no, they it's, needed it's, the money. It's, it's the worst kept secret that baseball is going to do everything they can just to get the playoffs so they get the playoff money. I mean, that's, that's, that's why they're doing this. That's why they're not shutting it down. That's why they're, that's why they're, you know, if you're even around another team and you might spread it, you're not going to play. You'll play some double headers later. Maybe we'll change the order of who you're playing. I mean, they're just, they're doing well, everything. Speak to that in, in, in terms of your little gambling environment we've been What's discussing. That? Well, think about it, Dob. Marlins might win it all because because it, it's going to come down in the end. Only the team, healthiest team, the Marlins, the only team never to lose a, a playoff series in baseball history. That's maybe true. Maybe they will be. That's maybe true. They will be but the I'm, team no, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying health will be a determining factor. If Mike health Trout gets COVID, huge. yes, during the playoffs, that's a huge variable taken out of that equation for sure. No, I mean it's it's going to be health and um, both directly and indirectly. I mean directly, you're taking those those players out of the lineup. Indirectly, health during the season um, is getting these games canceled. Now you've got a bunch of double headers. There's impacts on on pitching and all that right, as well. Right, right, right. So yeah, I mean, health is going to be. I wouldn't be surprised at all the teams, uh, at least by seeding. If we look at the final standings before the playoffs, because playoffs is a crapshoot, right? So right. if you look at the final standings, I I would not be surprised at all if there wasn't a decent correlation between like winning percentage and how many players you had to sit out or something, you know, something along those lines, measure something. That's going to be crazy to me. It is. It's going to be really, I think that, uh, I I don't think the city of Pittsburgh is really that affected by the pirates (laughs) only because sadly, I just don't think the interest is at least recently, the recent years is there because of poor performance and a perceived bad management, which is a whole nother discussion. Sure. But, uh, did you watch the penguins? Did you watch the hockey? 
watched a little bit um, of the Penguins. I, you keep you asked me a, a number of times. Does that upset you? Does that upset you? Does that upset you? I will tell you what upsets me. What upsets okay. me is when the Penguins are on AT and T Sports, and I don't get to watch the Pirates because I can't watch it on MLB, MLB TV because I'm locally blacked out. So yeah, that's what MLB, frustrates me. Yes, yes, I watched a little bit um, of the Penguins again. I grew up in the Bay Area. So I'm a Sharks fan. I remember when they started in '91. Right, right. Um, got to go to the Cup Finals games here a couple years ago. Right. Um, so I'm. I mean, I'm fine with the. I mean, I certainly was rooting for the Sharks during sure. during that. I'm sure. fine with the Penguins doing well. Uh, it doesn't bother me too much. Um, I like hockey. It doesn't feel like playoff hockey though. Playoff hockey's a joy. That's where I'm going. This with. doesn't feel like playoff hockey to me. Fans really are part of the equation. They are. I would say we're seeing it now. Really. I think the loudest thing I've ever been to, concerts, anything, was I remember I went to a Sharks playoff game in like 94, 95. That was ear-splitting loud. That was fun. That's yeah. hockey playoff games. Even though I was in my Sharks jersey and all the Penguins people were yelling at me uh, at the game, it's still fun to hear. You can survive an episode like that at a hockey game oh, in for Pittsburgh. Sure. People, you I, do I'm, that I'm Ste- overplaying this. You, people were pretty nice to me. Yeah, you do that at Steeler games. <laughs> I mean, I'll go to an Oakland. Oakland every uh, six years plays here in Pittsburgh. Um, Las Vegas. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> are you? Gonna, is your allegiance going to follow over to? Are, are you a Raiders fan? I'm sorry. No. No. Okay. No. But, but uh, I would. I'm a Steelers fan. I, was like, I grew up a football sure. fan, a casual football fan. And oh, the Raiders were the enemy back then. I'm just That's a, true. I'm just a baseball. I'm an A's fan since I was a kid. My so. parents had season tickets back in the '70s when the, all that stuff was going down at the Coliseum there and. All that. Stabler. Did, I can't remember. How did you get to be an A's fan? How, yeah, how just family. family. Walnut, Walnut Creek, California. Ah. I had uh, family there. there. And as a kid, uh, and it also was timing for me, selfishly, I I, I, I was um, six, I guess. I was five in 71. Oh, okay. So I vaguely knew what was going on watching Roberto in the 71 World Series. Gotcha. But between 71 and 72, whatever happened in that year, cognitively, I got it. And the only game in town was to watch the World Series, yeah, right? And, yeah. And the Pirates once in a while. I just <laughs> felt, and, they, and my family in Oakland was sending me gift packs with A okay. stuff. You know, they were they were well to do, uh, good good folks. So I, I had that, and once I was, I was just hooked. Three yeah. three World Series in a row. For as sure. far as I was concerned, oh at that God. age, there's no better team in the world than how you know no one can beat them. Well, then plus you had. Um like you said, you had the Pirates in 71, so you were like close to four World Series in a row. And then 79 came along. 79. So it was really, and the Pirates were always competitive in the 70s, yes, too. So it was just a good time as a baseball fan for sure. me to grow up there. Um, but the Raiders were always the enemy. Because all my family bled black and gold. My, my family, I think, was pretty passive toward the Pirates, yeah. which led, gave me that in to go root for another team. But when I go to the... A's games here when they travel and every there we play them every three years but they flip flop so it's every they six generally years. flip flop yeah they were just here years. last year and then in, I think it was twelve they were here prior I think, yes or thirteen I remember maybe. going to those games too but I don't get harassed at all people are I oh, mean God. oh I mean and the game I happened to go to out of the three was the Pirates one with a home run with, from uh, Marte okay. you know, in the 13th. So I, I felt a little razzing at that moment. <laughs> but there wasn't anybody in the stands. I know. I was and and say, I had seats right on the rail any on first base. And any opportunity to razz you, <laughs> Pirates fans, they will, they will take it when they can. They'll take it when they can. And, and, it, and I, I tip my hat. But no, no but, I, but I wouldn't wear a Cleveland or Baltimore jersey to a Steeler game. I don't think it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, sadly, you're probably right, and it's probably for the best. Yeah, it is, and that's I remember. Where... Um, I remember when I was in at West Virginia, and the first football game I went to because they get pretty into football there. You think they were playing uh, Virginia Tech? This was in 2005, where West Virginia ended up being pretty good, but no one thought they were that good. And I was waiting in the crowd to get into the stadium. There's just a big kind of you know mess of us. You know how crazy it gets like trying to get into these games. And there was a guy wearing. A Virginia Tech jersey that my lord to <laughs> sit and take that abuse it is something and I can imagine it being it's similar constant. to other oh my lord yeah I, I'll, I'll share this story too it doesn't reflect real well on, <laughs> on our city but I I was uh, I went to a Steelers Monday Night Football game in 98 I think the Packers came to town okay and it was a both teams were doing well it was very feisty and I just witnessed a lot of drunken uh, Steeler fans really being just utterly terrible to families of Packer fans who came in. And things that I saw, like just, uh, just witnessing that, I was embarrassed. And I think for me personally, 
you know, there's a darker side to, again, loyalty to a sports team, which ultimately translates, unfortunately, now to politics. Yeah. We're so yeah. it's extreme, right? We don't need that. There's a, you know, sports is supposed to be fun, a release. I mean, I, sure. you find it a release, right? For certain. I mean, right? he I, finds the gambling statistics a release. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, it's supposed I, to be a release. Enjoyment at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've been wired by playing baseball and coaching baseball and everything. Right. I seem, I seem to enjoy the game and the art of the game more than the outcome. I mean, I want the Pirates to do. I, I, you know, I've had Pirates tickets since I've been here. And sure. Sure, I like the Pirates doing well, and it was a blast going all those Absolutely. playoff games, and it was cool, and I like that. But, you know, I, as I say, kind of tongue in cheek, if if in this city, if you're watching baseball because you want the Pirates to do well, I don't think you're doing baseball right. <laughs> no, you're not doing baseball right. But, 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 so I could I could turn on any game and, and enjoy it. Okay, well, that's, that was my my last question for you was, can you still be a fan of the game that you grew up loving because of the very statistical work that you do and your insight into the game, which is way different than the average fan? More than ever, I think. I just, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, maybe having a little guy growing up and wanting, you know, and both my son and my daughter seems to like baseball more than, than, than he does, to be honest with you. Wow. Um just you know sharing that you know i i feel like i don't know the right way to say it but and I, there are certainly examples otherwise but i feel like baseball more than any other sport i'll get crap for this but i feel like baseball more than any other sport i feel like once you really truly become a fan i don't think you ever stop becoming a fan i was so agree i just with you. i just there are people that watch or for whatever reason and you may get upset with it and i don't think that's without example or excuse me, without exception i'm sure there are people during the strike that you know, said loved it but no more F fair enough I, i'm sure those people exist right, but right. for me like once i really got it i'll be a baseball fan forever absolutely it's just yeah, great it gets it's just in your blood and there's there's um it, it's in your blood and there's a there's a history to it that just the other sports don't have and i remember you see articles like this all the time and you know people say you know um oh there's i know what i'm thinking of there was an article in the in the post gazette i think or the trib or whatever it was about a guy that had been to like 61 straight opening days for the pirates you know he's in his 70s now but he, mm -hmm. however long he's been been to that many and he tried everything he could to try and get into pnc park no one could get in there right and so what he had to do this year was you know come on down i think they sat outside and had a beer or something like that whatever and just you know right. they were there for the right. it was a tradition and he took his kids and they always went and it was just kind of like this family thing and you hear this story about that and you know all i think is you don't have that in any other sport you don't right. get that that and so i always just think and people come in on facebook it's like and, and that is why baseball is the yeah. best sport. and it, things and like that you're so right and, and i think football the, the antithesis of, of people that want to argue baseball's validity in today's world are usually football fans. The football experience is different. Sure. You're more emotionally amped up for the entire experience from the moment you get there. Yeah. The Probably the pregame show on the radio in the car on the way down there. Sure. The tailgate. Yeah. Yeah. All you're amped up right. about, and it, and it has to do with the physical contact. It has to do with, like, you know, five seconds of just chaos. Right. Followed by 40 seconds of anticipation or two minutes of anticipation and chaos again. Right. I like baseball, and, and, and I don't think it's overstated when people say it's a thinking person's game because there is a lot of strategy and thought. I love the relaxed nature of it. There's a crescendo. There's a anticipation, especially in playoff baseball, For right? For sure. And as the innings get late in any game, there's an anticipation and, a, and a, an increased personal stress and all that. But it's beautiful to me. That is so – the way it builds, baseball builds, is so intrinsically beautiful and different that I don't find that in any other sport. I also feel, too – I'm not sure I could talk about it in the same way, but I feel like football requires – like a hundred percent of you all the time when you're there for all the reasons you just talked no about, question. whether it's, it's just, it's, it's intense and it's, it's, it's just a lot baseball. I feel you just can, it almost, you let it like wash over you and it's uh -huh. just the enjoyment of the, the art of the game. To be honest, I've, I've always loved baseball. It's just, um, and it's just, it's always, it's could always, it's just, it's like the perfect background sport, which is maybe not the best, like <laughs> right, the right, best right. argument for no, saying right. it's no, a no, great no, sport, no. but so get it. you don't need to be invested 100% 
for three and a half hours. Just, it's, it's just it's plenty in. of easy bathroom breaks in baseball <laughs> for men. Very Absolute, much so. Absolutely. But, so. but I love the, uh, the 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 pitcher batter duel. Yes, absolutely. That component of what absolutely. happens is so, and that's and that is unique about sports and in sports. Would you not agree? I would. I mean, there are certainly one-on-one scenarios that emerge in the other sports, but right. baseball is me versus you. I mean, that's you know, obviously there's other people involved, uh-huh. you know, on a play and something like that, but. Uh-huh. You know, and and hockey, you know, you will get that occasionally on like shootouts or you know a breakaway. You do get the one on one, but it's Same not intrinsically basketball. built into Correct. the game on in a scheduled fashion because yep. that's the that's a function of the game. Yep, yeah, you are one hundred percent correct. I mean, you know, the individual sports get at that, like tennis mm-hmm. or you know, golf isn't really one on one. It's you versus everybody else, and who mm-hmm. can be best? So you get it in tennis, um, and I, I enjoy watching tennis too. Um, but now the one on one, the strategy, the dynamics, it's unique to baseball. Are, are you such a traditionalist that you would shy away from automated strike zones? My issue with automated strike zones is people that argue for them get themselves down the path that we can get ourselves to an objective strike zone. And I don't think you can get there because if we're height, height the player exactly because you need someone you need someone to set that right to which you say. Uh, people have come back and said, "Well, you could just have, you know, the com- you know we have computer learning and all that, and they could learn, you know, the different this and the different." Or what that. if we just said dimension and we go that way? Then Altuve's in trouble, right? Uh, you know, and if it's computer reading, then you do like, do you remember the um, the kids like in the Little League World Series that was like three and zero, and they like sit down in the box, you know? Well, then why not do that? How's your computer going to tell me what's right and what's wrong? So it's still going to take, and even if a computer doing that, you still have someone programming it to do what it's going to do. So you're never going to fully take the the human aspect out of umpiring mm-hmm. like you just you can't do that so if the goal is to be like this is objective we're not gonna have any mistakes you're still baking human decision making into this at the end of the day Good inside point. outside is obviously you know different you know because that's i mean that's just sitting right there on the ground but. There's, a, there's an argument with me that i have a couple uh, angel hernandez is one of them uh, umpires that continue to get rehired every year <laughs> that just just do horrible jobs but there was every decade has theirs sure you know, there was a couple in the 70s and 80s and 90s. That's part of, to me, that's the beauty of the game. The, the lore of the game is there's still that human call. Um, are you a fan of instant replay? I, um, in certain instances, yes. So, for example, um, uh, like fair foul in the outfield, like by the foul pole or on the chalk line, if that's something that can be viewed to do. Where I get frustrated with instant replay is is the following. So let's say there's a play as someone's trying to steal second base mm-hmm. and um, the ball beats the individual down there by a good amount. Guy puts the tag down, pulls it up, right? So he doesn't break his wrist. Batter goes in, a runner goes in. In the past, that's called out. Every, and not only is it called out, but neither side's going to complain, right. right? Because the ball's there, you're out. That's right. what now we've got all of this minutia picking on, you know, you know, did he just barely get him or, you know, he got this crazy slide. Was he able to do this or do that? And I think it kind of gets away from the spirit of the way the game was kind of played. I have no problem with reviewing like a bang, bang play at first, like an out safe kind of thing, because all right, let's get it right. It's close. Um, the only change I would make, I, I wrote a, I wrote a piece online about how we should have um, wagering in um, instant replay. Like, <laughs> because, so we have like, um, oh, really? Yeah. Let me, I can't, it's been a couple of years, but it was something to the effect of, let's say, um, because it, it's one sided right now, right? Like this, uh, we have a, we have a, a play at the plate. They were called out. Um, only one side is going to want to review that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. So what if we like allowed teams to like wager and put prices on this to see if we can't like, what if I want to review this and I'm willing to forego like a strike or a ball against me next to bat, whatever way it goes. And then what okay. if the other side's like, I'll give up two to do this because I really feel it's good. And what if the other side, what if, then you get like kind of two sides going to instant replay. But all this, you know, if the ball beats you there, kind of a thing, and we're just looking for a technicality, never a big fan of that. Yeah, the, the bang, bang play, especially double header plays at second base. I mean, it, it, before replay, you right. could be anywhere in the area. And right. Give you the out. That was right. done primarily for safety. It was. Initially. And the thing is, it's were they technically on the bag no but both sides give that grace to the other and so you're not going to see anyone complaining right and that was totally fine and now it's you know it's got to be precise i i think the way one thing that i think they should do is 
you've got, let's say you got like a little clicker or something like that. You've got like three or four seconds to decide whether you want to review it. Instant replay, when it was brought Slow up, was designed to get the egregious calls corrected. Right. Not get the close ones precisely perfect. Right. Agreed. That, that one, who was it? Um, uh, Was it Galarraga that lost the perfect game on that call at mm-hmm. first? Hit the button right away. Yep, you missed that one. It happens, right? Mm-hmm. Let's rectify it and off we go. And I think the nice thing is it doesn't seem to be the case. One nice aspect of how it's been incorporated is it doesn't seem to be, not that I could tell, umpires don't seem to be getting an attitude about having calls overturned. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm I'm always right. I know what I saw. How First couple of seasons, a couple of them are Was advice. there some of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you, it's also funny. You're an older statesman. Because well, they're the ones not doing it, right? They call New York and then New York you know, reviews yeah. it and they tell them what yeah. to do. And then, they must have been told, uh, look, this is the way it's going to be. Your facial well, expressions and all that nonsense <laughs> need to go away. And they also told the, the managers that they can't argue with the umpires, which makes sense. They're not the ones ultimately making the decision. Did you see the one where Shelton was arguing and they had to stay away from each other? For the mass- <laughs> well, there was a, that was something. Oakland had a brawl yesterday with Houston. Did I did you miss see that? that. I did. Yeah, Larry Moore, Moore, He's yeah. nuts. He's not. He's but he, a, he was baited, though. He was baited by Houston's I only, I had coaching that, staff, which I, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I saw like a replay of it, so I didn't see it in context. But yeah, that was something. I, I don't. No, that's a whole other discussion. But I don't know how participatory any non-player on in an organization should become with on-field discrepancies of any kind. Sure, that, sure. That's not their. So a role. hitting coach for Houston, something wasn't. Yeah, it? Something he like shouldn't that? have taken the bait, but but. Naturally, here he we did. are. Right here we are. Yeah, and I just I wonder about the the, the veracity of and, and what they're involved with. But this was excellent, my friend. Excellent. I would love to have you back. Yeah, let's do yeah, it again. You're, you're you're very comfortable, obviously, in this <laughs> format. It must be the, the teacher in you, right? I guess that's that's a fun studio. I mean, Thank I, I you. just every time I'm babbling away here, it's fun. There's <laughs> lots of stuff to it's look at. A little eclectic, yeah. <laughs> it's very parochial to, I guess, me and that background. But it, I think it makes it a relaxing setting. Hopefully, you're, you're relaxed. And yeah, I'm a big music fan too, so uh, yeah. all this stuff's fun to look at. Very cool. I like it. Very cool. Got the Who right over here. I like we that. do have the Who. Yes, we have the Who. And uh, anything from the '70s, I pretty much pretty much dug a lot. Very good. Um, would have loved them and maybe to meet all those cats during the <laughs> guitar years, but we met our fair share. But sounds like it. Yeah, this was good, and we thank our mutual friend Phil Clark for connecting yes. us. But I would thank love you, to have you back. I, I, and I sure. will tell you um, where I'd like to see this show develop over time. Uh, not with every show, but I'm th- really thinking about uh, reaching back to my prior guests um, that are not in technical fields like yourself, bringing. A technical guest like yourself and, and bringing two diverse people from different backgrounds along with myself and basically talk about you know economics and so forth so we have a different uh, that'd be kind of fun yeah so if you're into that sounds interesting into doing means. that we'd love to, i'd love that opportunity because uh it's amazing how once you get to know people regardless of the field everybody's got got interests outside of what they do sure absolutely and uh you're, we had a, a ufo we had a ufologist on the other day and we went down the rabbit hole but he also was a man of science. He, he's he's got all the paper. He's a, an observatory um, uh, James Krug. So it added that whole spin on like it wasn't um, it wasn't far out stuff. It was what was reported, and then and it was it's the scientific method was applied to it. So we sure. got that even handed kind of pragmatic spin. But as soon as we did the show, all my prior guest goes, if you're going to bring me on again, that's the show. <laughs> so, But I think that the panel discussion format might lend really well to what we're doing. Yeah, that sounds – I certainly. I mean, this is fun. As, as I told you before we started, I'm a big fan of the long form kind Thank of stuff. Um, I like it a lot. Um, you can really kind of get into issues as opposed to just quick little sound I think there's an audience for it too, Matt. You know, I, I, I can tell by our through plays, and I, I look at our numbers too, and I'm surprised by – not just the amount of viewers for 15 seconds or 10 minutes. The actual through plays are amazing. The only thing I can think of is that these, the topics are engaging enough and people may be putting them on the corner of their, their work desktop. That's what Maybe. I was doing when I was listening to yours. I was getting some work done um, in the office and just had it kind of playing in the background. But it yeah, was, you know. yeah. And, the, and the audible only files, because we release it both the video and we do the audio with, with Google. And, and all you have to do is basically get the RSS feed with Google and, and Apple, and then everybody picks it up, which sure. is wonderful. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, it's been real well-received, and I'm sure this show will be as well. But, again, I want to thank you for coming in. Well, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Fun. We'll do it again. Awesome. All right, friends, we are out. <laughs>